I don't even have notes in All it. Right. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> so we're almost live again. Boy, it really is being a, a beast today. All right, there we go. Live. And now we just get to wait for everybody to find it again and pop back in. That's always the Facebook Live is so can be so frustrating. We've like with all the live streams that we've done, mm -hmm. there's been many that are part one, part two, oh, part yeah. three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It happens all the time. Uh -huh. Well, that's how I was asking uh, uh, Greg how y'all did it at the con because it's it it looks so smooth from the user end. That, I mean, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm sure that's not the case behind the scenes, but <laughs> at least it, it looks like that. Nice. Surprisingly, I think Greg kind of mastered uh, tried, having everything flow because tried a bunch of different stuff. Yeah, he definitely did a lot of experiments because we wanted it to feel really like like a, an event. You know oh, what I mean? Great. Like and we wanted it to feel like that. The clips too. between the sessions. Uh, uh, yeah. Everything else. Yeah. So, um, all right. It looks like yeah, we've got a few people back, and we're getting the comments rolling back in. Um, Excellent. Uh oh. Already, uh, one major comment in all caps says "frickin' goblins," my dude. Uh, so just so you know, True so you know what we're into. Right. Frickin' lack of goblins, my yeah, dude. Yeah, right. Um, no goblins, one star, my dude. One star. Right. <laughs> we'll talk about you know no goblins, one star at the very least. Um, so, hi. We got about twenty people on, so I'm just gonna jump right into it. I know we started a little late. We were having a few technical difficulties. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, there's a few notes because this is our season finale. Uh, there's just a few kind of loose ends that I want to tie up. Um, number one, we had a little bit of uh, uh, cross communication. And last week I was supposed to announce uh, that Ken Gerhardt's signed copy of the essential guide to Bigfoot uh, is going to Jeff Hoover, uh, who won that particular drawing. So Jeff, be looking for that winging its way through the mail. He'll pretty soon. Um, Tempest, who was on last week and helped us craft our on-air sigil, uh, doesn't quite have the finished version posted just yet, uh, but we're going to post a version of it in the comments that you can see, uh, since Leslie, true to her promise last week, has already chalked it uh, in specific alleys in Bloomington, Indiana. Uh, certainly, we support um, you know non-permanent chalking of magical sigils all over the world. Um, I also should have shown off this shirt last week, but didn't. Since we were talking with our witches, I, I brought my coven shirt. Um, this is a piece of art done by a good, good friend of mine named Maddie Stillwell. Uh, Maddie's one of those artists who uh, sells all her work out on the fence that surrounds Jackson Square. Uh, obviously, they're out of work, same as we are, uh, until everybody can come back. Uh, so if you check out uh, her webpage, and we'll put that in the comments as well. Uh, she's got a lot of really cool sugar skull, mermaid skeleton, uh, witchy coven art that y'all should check out. Uh, and finally, like I said, this is the season finale. Uh, so I swung for the fences uh, and somehow connected uh, with Greg and Dana Newkirk here. Um, and, and I feel like we got to take just the first hour even to catch people up with everything that, that y'all have done. Uh, in the paranormal field. So you're the literal yin and yang behind Planet Weird. Um, <laughs> That's a good way to put it, right? yeah. Uh, the curators of the Traveling Museum of the Paranormal and the Occult. Uh, and yes. two of the team members, we, you know, we, I think we called you stars, and then I felt maybe that was mean to Tyler and, and Carl and Connor. <laughs> two of the many stars uh, oh, of, yeah. of the paranormal documentary series Hellier. Uh, which if you're a friend of mine or if you've been watching the last uh, six episodes of this, um, you know I talk about all the time. It is my favorite, favorite rabbit hole. Uh, and hopefully we're going to demonstrate why uh, here in the next hour. So uh, Greg and Dana, again, thank you all so much for, for coming on. Um, what an awesome, I mean, what an awesome thing for me to be able to get to talk to you all in person. It's, it's just Aww. too neat. Yeah. Well, Thanks we're for glad to be us. here. Yeah. yeah. I was about to say, after two us. hours, I'm sure uh, you'll never want to speak to me again. So I'm gonna, I'm enjoying <laughs> no, it while I've got you. Um, Impossible. Yeah. We've been locked up together. That's uh, true. In we're the just same house. Can for we talk to so other people? Anyone. So we're excited to talk to you. Well, and that's just it. And I know Greg and I we were having a, a great conversation. Uh, so much so that we almost 
forgot that we were supposed to start at eight o'clock. Uh, but we were talking about, you know, sort of what the future of paranormal conventions and lectures and oh, yeah. and that whole community is going to look like now that we're yeah. so uh, um, differently connected, I guess. Yeah. A lot like um, this, I think. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. Sure. And, and, and it's, it's so strange. And, and I think, and again, we'll get this, but the museum is a great example where you've got a, a fan base of about a thousand people uh, who really do have daily access to y'all, uh, mm -hmm. which in yeah, the paranormal field is, I mean, that's unheard of. Um, and, and so, you know, as I was saying earlier, you, you lead by example, certainly. Um, and I like what we're seeing here. So we're going to hopefully, uh, inspire everybody else, uh, to, to do a lot more of that. Um, uh, but we, we got to talk about the, the, the big goblin in the room first, right? <laughs> uh, which yes. is, which is this phenomenon literally that, that is hellier. Uh, so I know we've got, I think a, a pretty broad, a variety of viewers here. I know there are two or three uh, hardcore initiates like me because I can see them posted in the comments thread. Uh, and then I imagine we have a few that, that don't know anything at all about sure. Hellier. And somehow we're going to have to balance the desires of, of all these people. Of course. Uh, so, so right out of the gate, um, let's talk about Hellier season one because there's two seasons out right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can find it on Hellier.tv uh, and on Amazon Prime. I don't know. Is it still on YouTube or has that gone yeah, away? Yeah, it's still on, YouTube. Still on yep. YouTube too. So um, if you were wondering what am I going to watch on Friday nights after that, you've got 15 hours or so of, of really just quality uh, documentary television there. Um, but season one is very different from, from season two. Uh, yes. And I was hooked at season one. Uh, and then season two took it to a whole different level. Uh, yeah. But I know season one was, it was, a, it was a real slow burn. Um, we, we like to refer to season one as a prologue. Yeah, I think and, it's the best description of what it really is. Yeah, because it really gives you all the setup that you need to really appreciate how weird and big season two is. Yeah. Right, right. and we were also talking about the, the sort of accelerated rate at which this is dropped. So, yeah. uh, you know, I remember hearing you guys talk to, to Ben and Aaron on Mysterious Universe, not about season two, but about season one, I think in January of 2019. Yeah, that sounds about yeah, right. Sounds and right. so we're not even 18 months later. And here we yeah, are with yeah. season one's dropped, season two has dropped. Um, we've been yakking about season two for at least the last four or five months, um, if not before. So uh, already I see, when you consider this goes back to 2012, Yeah. Uh, like I said, you spent six years really you know, investigating on and off. And then all of a sudden, it's like somebody just put the pedal to the floor. Um, and so I know not only are the episodes coming fast and furious, uh, but kind of on y'all's end, the, uh, the threads are starting to pull, I think, faster and, and harder on oh, y'all, yeah. right? So you've been kind of swept up in this current. Uh, but let's talk, let's go all the way back to 2012 for people that haven't seen it. And let's talk about that initial um, instigation, that initial event that, that hooked y'all. Well, in 2012, uh, Dan and I were running uh, an online magazine that at that time was called Who Forwarded. Now it's Weak and Weird. Mm -hmm. uh, I always explain the joke because not everyone knows who Charles Fort is. Right. Charles Fort is widely considered to be the father of modern paranormal research. Mm -hmm. And uh, we thought it was funny. Dana actually came up I with did. the name. I did. Yeah, I'm a big fan of fart jokes, so well, if and, I can uh, get them in there anywhere. You should always have a pun just ready to go, I think. So, <laughs> yeah. right. I feel like that was my best fart joke to date. Uh, I don't know if I'm ever going to get better than who farted. <laughs> and so people were, uh, pe we were used to people sending us, you know, strange stories. We That's the type of stuff that we would write about all the time. Oh, absolutely. Weird yeah. stories, personal uh, accounts of hauntings, Bigfoot sightings, mm -hmm. sightings. dogman sightings, UFO oh, sightings, all yeah. that kind of stuff. And we had a lot of black eyed kids sightings too. Like, we, oh, yeah. it was whatever was kind of sort of, we'd ride the wave of sightings uh, that would come in. Interesting. But one day I got an email that was a little weirder than the rest. Mm -hmm. And it was about a guy who said that there were little goblins coming out of a mine shaft on the edge of his property, mm -hmm. tapping on his kids' windows, said they were, they stole his dog doing weird stuff like shoving Christmas wreaths into mailboxes and just being scary mm -hmm. and i realized that the email had actually come to the old ghost hunters incorporated email which was my high school ghost hunting team <laughs> really so. i mean and i mean in all love it's it's almost like it's still on geocities if it was still around like i've seen the oh, website yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah 
Oh, it's, I mean, it was, it was super old yeah. and, and, and it, the website was still up at that time, mm -hmm. but there's no reason anyone should have contacted Ghost Hunters Incorporated. Right. The image of, it's just a bunch of teenage boys in like zebra print bowling shirts <laughs> with medieval axes and BB guns and stuff. Oh, I the guy with the, the pellet gun across his chest. Yeah, yeah. exactly. The pellet gun. <laughs> um, a bunch of terrible... Terrible boys. Oh, Not people as, that as you as one of those terrible boys. Problem. Yeah, I did the exact same thing <laughs> yes. going up. So, and so that was weird. First off, because this person said that a man, a mutual acquaintance, uh, said you're the person who can fix this problem. Mm -hmm. I'd never dealt with goblins before, or like <laughs> right. anything like that. You're, was, you're like me. Like, you were a ghost hunter. You're, you're teenage yeah. ghost hunter, yeah. right? And uh, so I, I always try and be respectful even of things that i think are crazy or mm -hmm. ridiculous or even when somebody's putting me on i thought it was from a friend or something and i just said well listen uh i live in canada i can't come down to kentucky just on a whim <laughs> like i need to know that there's something to this like do you have any evidence that you're not just spinning me a yarn mm -hmm. sends the guy sends back uh a bunch of photographs of footprints and uh what he says are images of the creatures which were stereotypically blurry out of focus right right messes in the distance um but the footprints were really interesting right um i sent them to friends of mine who are bigfoot investigators because they're the only people i could think of to send them to and they're like listen these things have dermal ridges on them which are like fingerprints for well, that's a feet. huge thing so we had ken gerhardt on a couple weeks ago and that's what mm -hmm. we were talking about is that dermal ridges are really the the fingerprints to a bigfoot cast if those don't Absolutely. exist the likelihood that it's a hoax goes up exponentially uh Absolutely. and they're, they're on the other side they're very difficult to hoax yeah yes. um, yeah so, that's what we learned too right. and it was it, that was i think one of the that was the clincher yeah honestly mm -hmm. was was having bigfoot friends go uh, you might actually want to take this yeah. seriously. This is interesting. And we were right. like, oh, okay. <laughs> when, when I had enough people I knew who were like, give me the details of this case. I want to, I want to check this thing out myself. I was like, oh, okay. All right. This must be for real. <laughs> so I said, okay, sure. Let's figure this out. He was like, you guys can come down. You can shoot anything. Just don't show my face. Do whatever mm -hmm. you want. And then uh, he disappeared. Poof. Right. He's gone. Poof. <laughs> Into nowhere. The guy said his name was David Christie, right? Right. Um, I wrote an article about it. I put it up I'm on my Facebook page, uh, and, and got people's, uh, whatever their opinions were about what was going on. And then it just sort of crashed and burned and there was nothing. And I was like, okay, right. it must not be for real. Well, and it does. It's interesting because if it was somebody that was hoaxing inside our community, um, it, it does have some, some really strong resemblances to the old Hopkinsville goblin case back in the 1950s. <laughs> which is a Kentucky exactly. case where goblins show up and terrorize a family, get into a shootout with them. Uh, I mean, it's exactly. a wild story, um, but, but the, the description, at least of the creatures and their behavior is fairly similar. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I the, think- what's, oh, go ahead. what's so funny is, and, and this is something I think people forget, and, and I try to remind people of is, never anywhere in those emails is the word goblin yeah. used. It was actually us that started oh, wow. referring to what's them David as goblin. Him? Does he just call them? Critters or just, just I think creatures. Creatures, yeah. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. never uses the word goblin, mm -hmm. and it was us that went did the same thing. We're like, this sounds so much like what's because I mean the first thing you do is you start googling about yeah, weird guys in Kentucky, in Kentucky right? right? Yeah. And uh, of course, there's the Hopkinsville Goblin case, mm -hmm. the Kelly Goblin, uh, Kelly Greenman, and everything about it from like this rural home to these creatures coming out and and even coming up to the windows, looking in the windows, scaring the family. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, this sounds just like the, the Kentucky Goblin case. So maybe it's the return of the Kentucky Goblins. Right. So we were the people who said Goblin. It was, ne it was never them. Mm -hmm. Fair enough, right. Um, but, but what's interesting about that is that it's a very, it's a well-known case, but it's so, I thought it was so fringe. It's so out there oh, um, right. as, as a bizarre one. Uh, and yet, I, you know, I was talking on the in the museum forum about this just a few days ago as I was reading through getting ready for Ken's interview and reading the essential guide to Bigfoot. He starts talking about, well, here's these different kinds of Bigfoot tracks that we see. 
There's also these little three-toed ones, but we mostly only see those in like the Kentucky, Ohio area. So right. even the Bigfoot hunters knew that these existed and just kind of dismissed them because it wasn't their area of interest. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's an outlier that among a lot. them as well. A lot. Right. Yeah. Uh, but the region is the right place. The description is the right place. And so, yeah. so we do, there's a body of sort of anecdotal evidence to, to support it. Uh, but it's going to get stranger before we get out of this because then we have to track down this mutual acquaintance uh, that directed David Christie to your long defunct website. Uh, and that's, this is when it starts getting curiouser and curiouser. So we in, uh, it was early 2013, late 2012, we were on the road shooting uh, a documentary series uh, that never, never panned out, mm -hmm. uh, never turned into anything, but people see some of this actually in seasons of hellier uh some of the footage from this and so we're going to places like brown mountain for example oh, right. one of the places we went we went there to try and get abducted by aliens mm -hmm. so there's a whole thing that that started back in 2012 2013 and while we were there like the whole reason we were there was not to go look for an alien cave base or anything like that. Like none of that stuff had even crossed our mind. Ghost life we and were, aliens. Yeah. We, we were there because like, Hey, if we're going to try and get abducted by aliens, the old fashioned way, mm -hmm. let's go to a place where people see UFOs. Right. Brown mountain was the perfect place. Mm -hmm. Our friend, Micah Hanks was from the area. Yeah. Another good Fordian scholar, right? Yeah. We were yeah. like, dude, will you take us up to where we can see the lights? And just hang out with us and we'll do an interview and we'll talk about alien abductions, stuff like that. And while we were there, he's like, you know, there's this old story that there's an alien cave base here. And that wasn't why we were there. But if and you're we there. Just, but but <laughs> I mean, we're there and, and we're like, yeah, dude, let's go, take us. Right. And so he told us this whole story about how uh, a, a psychic had envisioned it and this whole thing. And um, we went with him. And we found this place and it, there was a cave and it looked like there'd been a big rock that was put in yeah. front of it and we couldn't get past it. Uh, and we just were like, well, fun story. Right, you know, exactly. I don't think any, none of us were like, yes, there is definitely a cave base that goes into the mountain yeah. where there's at literal aliens. I think yeah. we all kind of left that, that instance going, this is weird. Uh, yeah, but but not like there's definitely right. I don't think definitely. we're not the type of people who like to say definitely. Yeah, mm -hmm. but but definitely like you know, and it was weird enough that we're all kind of like, hmm, that's kind of interesting. This is an interesting looking rock that's been randomly placed here. It's what it seems. Right. So we finish the rest of our shoot, mm -hmm. um, and then we go home. A few weeks later, I get an email that's from Terry Wrist this mutual acquaintance right. who says, why did you stop when you were so close? Um, and then it, like, I have something for you one week. Mm -hmm. Send an email, no response for yeah. a week. And you've got no idea who a Terry Wrist oh. is. You don't know no, a Terry no Wrist. You're not no, friends no with him. Right. right. No clue. Don't really think anything of it. Crazy I mean, email the thing, out of the blue. We get weird shit like that all the time. Right. Send us weird emails all the time. Um, the, 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 that stuff has increased exponentially in the last <laughs> year, let me tell you. Yeah. Um, there's, there's probably a dozen Terry Wrists that have emailed me now. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> but this was interesting. And so, like, we waited a week. A week later, uh, email comes in, and it says Hellier was uh, – what did it say? It, said it was Hellier just was a, a symptom. symptom. Yeah. Uh, Hellier was just a symptom. For every door closed, a window must be opened. Use the numbers. And it's all spelled weird, very seemed very coded. Mm -hmm. And there was uh, an image attached, and the image had a sequence of numbers on it. Did the same thing that I did before. I posted it to my Facebook page, and I was like, anybody have any insight on this? The first person to come to any conclusion says, well, that looks like a credit card number. Yeah. I was like, oh, shit. So I pulled it down right yeah, away. 16 digits, right. I didn't know what was going to happen. Right. But then somebody else said, no, 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 those are GPS coordinates. And we punched them in to Google Maps and they pop up at Brown Mountain, at least the Brown Mountain vicinity. Right. And we like looked at each other for, the, for two reasons. One, no one knew the name of the town. We had never told yeah. anyone the name of this town. We'd never oh, used Hellier. Right. Even when yeah, Hellier and they dropped came the out. Name. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
um, like we, we posted, we hid the guy's name and we hid the name of the town. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the fact that this person knew the name of the town was one big thing. Yes. And then the other one was like, how did this person know we were in Brown Mountain? Right. Right. What are they, who's what were they pointing you? to? Yeah, exactly. And who's watching us? Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And so like, I think I even like sent an email to Micah and I'm like, what's this all about? Like, are you pulling my yeah, leg? You're funny, dude. He's yeah. like, well, here, he's like, no, check this out. He's like, this looks like the letters that John Keel used to get from the, right. yeah. from the uh, international bankers, right. uh, even down to like the weird spelling errors and stuff like that. And so that's what got us interested in actually pursuing the case. Right. We ended up moving to Cincinnati not too long after this. We were in Cincinnati, which that's a whole other weird synchronistic thing. We got a job in Cincinnati randomly that we probably shouldn't have had <laughs> working, working for us, an internet startup that just like found us online and was like, Hey, I, I own a tour company. No, jobs? Nobody should have given me this much responsibility. I, I know <laughs> yeah. very well. Well, yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. <laughs> uh, so we end up in Cincinnati and then we realize, huh, we're only a few hours from Hellier. Yeah. We should go just check this place out. We'll just see what's going on. And we drive out there and I, printed out photos of the footprints and I just start asking around and all of these people are hiding, like hiding in the car. <laughs> which is the, the I mean car, look, I went I went to high school and uh and college in rural Indiana, which is more or less where we're talking about. You know, that that yeah. part of Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that's not a place I like to go to random towns and just start asking people no. questions in the middle of gas station parking lots. Yeah, and yet, people, right? people were thing. very suspicious. I, mean, I, I grew up in a very small town, yeah, definitely, yeah. super, super rural. And so I have an affinity to this. Like I was born in West Virginia. Mm-hmm. Like I got it in my blood. Man. It's, so. it's Greg, I, I got to say, one of the things I noticed rewatching it this time around, it, there is an adorable sort of code switching where if you listen... Oh. You you lean. I do it too when I when I'm giving tours. You lean into the accent when sure, you're talking yeah, to some of them, do it. right? Oh, yeah. yeah, you kind of fall I back fall on back that, that old it. good old boy talk. Um, mm-hmm. But absolutely, gets you in the door. Yeah, tiny tiny town, mm-hmm. more cows than people. Like th- that's the type of place I grew up, and so yeah. I I can convert. My dad was a Baptist minister. I had to talk to everybody all the time, and so I wasn't. Freak, very freaked out by it because like I know what people in small towns are like and yeah. I know how untrusting they are of outsiders and so you know it's just like hey I'm in town because I'm looking into this and here's the thing when you have a weird story yeah. and you start to ask people questions about weird stories if they get comfortable like that's all they want to talk about yep. because they everybody wants a good story like they want to talk about it they want to tell you the crazy things they've heard mm-hmm. And people had stories. They were talking about UFOs the size of football fields, hovering above the town, strange right. government men coming to town, telling them not to talk about this, saying this was a satellite, uh, talking about weird creatures running across the road. Some of them had seen three-toed footprints. Like everything oh, started uh, to match yeah, up. Yeah, and it's, it is. It's just a, it's a laundry list that comes out, right? Babies crying in abandoned mines yes. in the hills, all sorts of just crazy, crazy paranormal high strangeness. Um, and so we end up uh, just – Decide we're going to drive around. It's not a big place. Let's see if we can find this guy. And that's the other thing too. It's like we were saying, have you ever met a man named David Christie? Is there a yeah, man? Where's named this David guy? Christie right. Can we find him? Mm-hmm. And everyone's like, no, they even bring in old timers who are saying I've lived here my entire life. I've worked in all the mines. Never like mm-hmm. there's nobody. Christie's not even a name from around here. Mm-hmm. They knew David. But they didn't know any David Christie's. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was weird. But we decide to drive around and just see what this area is like. Most of the roads out there that split off from the main highway only exist because they used to go to old mines. Mm-hmm. So there's old like strip mining operations, old coal mining operations all over the place up there. And I mean, it gets like, it's the sticks, man. Like it's the middle of nowhere. And we're driving around and all of a sudden we see this place that matches every description of the house and David's mm-hmm. emails right down to the the shed in the backyard it didn't look like people had been there in a couple of years like right. it, it was grown up just enough everything had clearly Evidence no one of children lived there. yeah i mean it, it checked all the boxes yeah. and it looked like mm-hmm. everybody had just left uh-huh. and we were like this might be the place this could be it and we decided okay this was a really great uh reconnaissance mission 
let's figure it up. We'll, we'll figure out what we're going to do. We're going to gear up and we're going to come back. It was literally a couple weeks after that, that we got asked to do like our first big TV appearance, which was a finding Bigfoot special. Oh, sure. Yeah. And then life just went nuts mm-hmm. and we never had the chance to go back. And that's where the story sat. Oh, like years. we never, we never did anything else. Yeah. Until our friend Carl Pfeiffer, the director of Hellier, uh-huh. several years later, we met him at the Stanley Hotel where he was one of the uh, resident investigators there. Right. And he had was listening to an old episode of a podcast where I was talking about the case and he was tweeting about it as he was listening. And then all of a sudden our Week and Weird uh, website tweeted out about one of the articles. We've written two articles about it tweeted out one of those articles mm-hmm. and Carl's like, ah, I see what you did there. You're paying attention to me watching this. And I'm like, no, I have nothing to do with that. That's an auto tweet that just tweets random articles from an archive of like almost 2000. Mm-hmm. So that was Carl's first synchronicity. That was his first synchronicity. Wow. And, and he went, we need to do this. Yeah. I think we're being called to do this project. Mm-hmm. Like we need to go and find this guy. He and talks I- really early on about feeling that, that yeah. pull, you know, like that just being yeah. called to do it. Right. Yeah, I think that he, uh, af- directly after that, experienced kind of a synchronicity storm mm-hmm. for like the next couple weeks, I think. And every single time it happened, he would just become more and more sure that we had to He would go just text me and be like, like we you have, gotta do we this. We have to do this. We mm-hmm. have to. And Carl, if you've ever, like, when you meet Carl, he's very chill. He's very, he's a very relaxed guy. He's not the kind of guy who's like, we need to go to this right now. He's no. very calm. And so even for Carl, that's like those synchronicities were really intense, intense enough to really, you know, force him to get to that point where he knew this is happening. We need to do this. I didn't want to do it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I didn't. I, I, cause I told him like, we had all these ideas for different projects we mm-hmm. wanted to make. And I said, don't you want to do something that's like a sure thing? Like, we don't know. Yeah. Like this right. could all be, this could all be made up, yeah, man. Like yeah. somebody could have just been yanking our chain. We might go there and find nothing. Mm-hmm. And he just felt so convinced that this was something that we were supposed to be doing. I just kind of threw my hands up. was like, okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I hope it works out because I don't know what we're going to find <laughs> right. like goblins. Like, come on, go- yeah. goblins. Right. So and um, that's how hell you're starting. But so spoiler for, for season one, for anybody that, that hasn't mm-hmm. watched this yet, uh, there are in fact, no goblins. <laughs> I thought you were going to say there are in so, fact no, goblins. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, 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 no. No. Uh, uh, if you look real close in one frame, no, no, uh, <laughs> I think that's Tyler's buddy in a Bigfoot outfit, but, uh, but other than that, no. <laughs> so, um, so when you, cause when you watch season one, I knew there was some time between that initial, uh, kind of reconnaissance mission. And when you go oh, to the yeah. cabin and, and really have those experiences, but I didn't realize it, it's, it's years between those years. two. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so when, um, when we're at the cabin and we have that first, uh, Estes method, which we'll we'll dig into in just a second. What year are we looking at then? Two thousand seventeen. Two thousand seventeen. Yeah. Okay, so we're yeah. not not too long ago. Um, so uh, you know, and and we joke not not to spoil the whole first season, but uh, it turns out the goblins don't show up at the end. Uh, right, I think guys. if they had, there wouldn't have been a second season, right? There it is, proof of goblins. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's it. Right? We're done. <laughs> All right, man. Um, I'd be I'd be rolling it up. Bet a gold coin right. right now. Gold. The sci fi <laughs> channel brought to you by Planet Weird, brought to you yeah. by, right? Uh, so, but, but what's really fascinating about that is, and I think you even mentioned it either in an interview or at one point, you say, you know, with the state of paranormal television being what it is, mm-hmm. if you say goblins and then don't produce goblins, like, yeah. you're, yeah. you're going to hear about it on the internet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, we, also, we did. there was a big goblin on the front cover. And, uh, you know, <laughs> we set ourselves up for it, but I, I don't think we really understood. So, and this is what people need to realize about Hellier. We thought we were going out to make a, a 45 minute yeah. hour long short film, right. like a documentary uh, that was like catfish, right? Like we were going to find out who is this person? Mm-hmm. Why did they say they had goblins? Did they have goblins? Is there evidence of this? That's what we thought we were doing. And so it wasn't until we were there and we started to see like the, the, 
the synchronicities we were having, right. the way that people were acting about things, the way that it made us feel. That's something we didn't really, we don't really talk about a whole lot, but like even like through that whole thing, there's a feeling that this, what we were doing was something we needed to keep doing. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, it's over. We don't, we, we shoot the first season mm -hmm. and we think, okay, well, we're going to put it out there. <laughs> we didn't, we didn't know what we, we were going to expect. And I even told Carl, I was like, I'm a little nervous because we don't find goblins. <laughs> right. Goblins right. Yeah. So, right. But I didn't expect so many people to be so mad. Like the problem is I think that we've been trained from paranormal television for the last 20 years that everything is very simple. There's a three act structure to each television yep. episode. Everything is going to wrap up real nice and neat in a bow problem is that's not what it's really like right. in, in any paranormal research the fact that there are a few that you can wrap up into a bow is insane mm -hmm. because that's not normally how this works you don't if we had the answers it wouldn't be paranormal well that's just it that's what i, I told her about you know as a, as a working magician in a ghost store I, you know we would get that kind of tongue-in-cheek question all the time well when are we going to see the ghosts on the ghost store and and you just have to develop a quick shutdown reply right and right. so my my kind of old standby was uh sir if i could promise you ghosts on this tour i'd have charged you a lot more money for your ticket right? uh you know like <laughs> exactly. right. i mean you know that's that's just it um yeah though you know it's funny we joke all the time about you you literally got an, a uh, review i think on it was amazon wasn't it yeah it just uh, says no goblins one says, star no goblins yeah it's a one star review yeah <laughs> which is too funny. i mean it's it's I can't remember if it was an exact, if that's the exact review, but like it's that. close enough that yeah. just saying like making that joke of like no goblins, one star mm -hmm. is sort of a bunch of, of reviews distilled down to their purest form. Whoa. And it's so, it's so weird because I think that what we experienced and found is actually weirder, I think, than goblins. Like it, it's something that's bigger and stranger and, and more complex than just the idea of a goblin. Well, so that's, you know, it's funny. That's, that's again, part of the themes that we've been just sort of, you know, that have been coming up organically over and over and over again uh, while we've been doing these interviews with folks is uh, uh, sort of the old adage that the longer you look into the paranormal, the more it tends to pay attention back. You know, it looks oh, back yeah. at you. And, and hell, you're a perfect example of this. And of course, we're going to dive into season two in just a second. And that's when it really just, goes off the rails in every yeah. conceivable way. Um, and, and so I think that's a perfect example. But also I, I see comments saying, um, you know, a friend of mine named Kia says, that's why I love Hellier so much, because it's just down the rabbit hole. Um, yeah. And that's something else I've been trying to communicate to folks is that when you look into this, you're going to start somewhere. And it doesn't matter. You can be a Bigfoot hunter or a, a you know, a MUFON person or a ghost hunter. And if, if you stay in that world long enough, you'll realize you need to study all those other subjects too, oh, because yeah, eventually sure. they all connect with one another. Uh, and so There's the idea so that there was, there was a paranormal documentary out there that covered, you know, for lack of a better word, the entire phenomenon, rather than just that facet of it that appealed to them, you know, just the ghost part or just the Bigfoot part. Um, and, and it was funny because when I brought Ken on, I, I very deliberately brought a hardcore materialist cryptozoologist who you know turns his nose up at interdimensional bigfoot and <laughs> right. you know everything is is a, is a species and I, I respect his work uh as an sure. investigator so much because sure. he takes that that sort of approach um but it, it's it, i found it harder to talk to him because i wanted to ask him about things like okay mm. well what about the louisiana loop guru do you think that's a cryptid yeah. or is that a dog man and I know you don't really believe in dogmen because that's supernatural. That's not cryptozoic, you know. And and so when you have to start splitting those hairs so finely, yeah. I think you lose something. Um, well, here's the thing: if you th here's the thing, and and this is from experience. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to name names, mm -hmm. but when you start to pull these flesh and blood cryptozoologists, sit down at the bar, mm -hmm. have a couple drinks, oh, drink, there's that. And then right. they start telling you stories, and you're like, you mother aren't you talking about this <laughs> because you know there's more to it like i literally I, I was having conversations with cryptozoologists who've been abducted by aliens but, but they won't, won't talk won't about it. it right 
Well, but I think that's because, you know, they're, they're trying so hard to be accepted as, as yeah. any kind of mainstream science. And sure. as soon as you step off that that materialist, you're 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 in the weeds yeah. forever. Yeah. And so, well, you know, I, I I've got news for them. I hope the scientists <laughs> view them the same way they view the. Well, yeah, right. Yeah, it hasn't no, helped the cause really at all. Matter, but, man. My right. hope, if anything, if I could ever just sort of like reach out to that community, is of all of the just keep track of the weird stories that you're hearing because you might not want to look into them, but there's a lot of other people who absolutely would be happy. They're with valuable. Them. They really yeah. are, and, and the more. The more, I mean, there's, there's, you know, some kind of a, a, a place where people could uh, start those investigations, mm-hmm. the better, because um, I think, like you said, you know, there's a lot of them that have had very weird experiences, but you're right. And, and the cryptozoology community, it's a tough community because people really don't want you to kind of step out into any spaces that they think is wooey. I don't want that. I don't buy that wooey And it's, stuff. it's too bad, mostly because... You know, I think a lot of paranormal investigators and people that are interested in kind of crossover investigating, uh, we could be looking into a lot of those cases, and that would be amazing. But um, my hope is that they just don't get lost. You know, and, right? And well, and that there's there's correlations and and yeah. you know repetition that they might not see that somebody else from a different absolutely. sphere absolutely, oh, absolutely. will see. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, and I think that's the bravery behind season one of of Hell Year is that. You aired this five-part documentary where, where literally, I mean, the goal is find goblins in Kentucky. <laughs> and at the end of the show, not to, not to spoil it too much, uh, we get to a tin can. A tin can. That's as close as we came to goblins. And yet, the, the, the you know, without spoiling that whole season, the, the meaning, you know, the, the relevance of that tin can is, is so huge. And the synchronicities that you just see pile up and pile up and pile up. Um, it's it's baffling, uh, and yet I don't know of any other paranormal show out there that shows you the dead ends. Yeah, right? no, um, no, and I mean, and, and I think the issue is uh, the dead ends are just as frustrating for the audience as they are for the investigators. Sure. And and most television is meant to placate an audience to make an audience feel really good. Right. And I think part of the reason why Hellier has has gotten the type of uh, followers that it has mm-hmm. the type of people who keep up with it and feel very invested in it is because they had to be frustrated with us yeah. mm-hmm. that's why they feel like they're there because they actually are as frustrated as we are yeah. at those moments and we let them experience that because that i think is part of whatever hellier is supposed to be mm-hmm. that's part of it mm-hmm. and uh at the end of the day we find a tin can yeah at, right at the Season one. But it's one. it's meaningful. It means something, right? Yes. Um, <laughs> it, it means something to some people. Yeah. Well, but sure. You have been the weird, on the journey. The weird thing there. about Hellier is, I think the people that are meant to resonate with it do, mm-hmm. and the other ones are just like, well, no I wonder, goblins in this thing. When frankly, like, dude, if you expected to see a goblin in this thing, yeah, you want to be. It wouldn't be a free series on right, YouTube. Exactly. <laughs> well, and I wonder too. I wonder in the investigative community, you know, how many of us that have actually done, you know, real ghost hunting investigate. You know, I've been in Waverly overnight, just like y'all, and and everything sure. else. And and the thing is, is that when you see that on television, or even when I present uh, uh, findings online to people, you're presenting the wins. You don't show them the dead ends oh, because yeah, that's yeah. not what they're there for. And so yeah. for me, it was it was finally getting to see an investigation on TV play out like every investigation I'd ever done, because so much of investigation is not compelling television. No, it's, no. it's Googling stuff and reading emails yeah. and sitting in a dark yeah. room talking to yourself for six hours. And then, you know, even more fun, listening to the audio of you sitting in a dark room talking yeah, yeah. to yourself for six <laughs> exactly. hours. Nobody wants to watch that stuff. And so... You know, to me, I guess I, I identified with it because I'm like, oh, this is this is legit. This is how it actually works every yeah. time I've tried it myself. And so I think that authenticity rang uh, with those of us that were kind of, you know, in the know already. Oh, sure. And, and so we latched onto it very, very much. Um, there is one other thing about season one that I think hooked me personally that I want to talk about. Um, so I, I've done lots of ghost hunts and seances over the years. Um, and and as, as you guys, I'm sure you know, you, you get uh, sort of friends and fans out of that community that will follow up with you, you know, years down the line. And so uh, I have a person who's a, a ghost hunter a little further out west, uh, and she's young. I think she's around, you know, 20, 21, maybe. 
Uh, and here I am pushing 40. So um, it's weird to be a mentor, but she occasionally sends me, I've gotten Facebook messages in the middle of investigations. You know, like it's 1 a.m. and they're in a dark room somewhere. Do you think I should do this? And I just go, yeah, do whatever you want. Uh, yeah. But one of the questions I was asked about were, were the use of spirit boxes. Um, and it's the one of the few times where I have to go, oh, you know, usually I try to be really positive, but I got to admit, I hate spirit boxes. They're worthless. I'm with you. Right? I, um, I, I mean, it, it, they are a lesson in confirmation bias. Yeah. Um, and especially coming from a tour community where so many ghost tours will do it because you have a crowd of 30. And all yeah. you need in that crowd of 30 is one really enthusiastic person. And so you ask some big open-ended question and the box goes, and the one guy goes, did you hear that? That was a yes. And now everybody's on board. And, and so yep. I've always thought it was a tool of, of kind of lazy investigators um, and, and hoaxers. And then along come Carl and Connor. <laughs> and they just- <laughs> yeah. same, same exact story for us. They set it on its, on its end and it's amazing. Um, so I'll let you, you, you have much more experience with it than I do. So I'll let you briefly describe uh, the Estes method. Um, and we'll talk about why I think that's, a, that's different. The Estes method was developed by Carl and Connor uh, while they worked at the Stanley Hotel. Yeah, in Estes like Park, the, Colorado. In right. Estes Park, which right. is why it's called the Estes method. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to figure out a way to kind of do a, a double blind uh, experiment with mm -hmm. these, the spirit box, which, I mean, it's, it's a very ubiquitous tool for ghost hunters. Um, and the, what a spirit box is, if there, in case there's anybody who doesn't, doesn't know, it's, it's a little radio mm -hmm. where it has a sweeping circuit in it that you can speed up or slow down with AM or FM. And the idea is, which frankly, I think is ridiculous. I'll just say it. Yeah, I, I hate spirit right. boxes. I hate them. The idea is that the spirits are somehow manipulating the circuitry or manipulating the radio waves yeah. or whatever to have their voices come through, which I feel like if they have the ability to do that, why wouldn't they just move if, something or slap you across the face or right, whatever? Yeah. Right. It seems like a much bigger thing to do than to have a crackly voice go, you know what I mean? Like, right. I don't yeah, you might as well just pull an old spirit trumpet out and use that. Right. Exactly. The same, right. Exactly. Yeah. Much more analog. Yeah. I think there's interesting history to ITC and instrumental transcommunication. Mm -hmm. um, you, know, you, you start to look at things like like rod of a circuits and things like that. Right. I think that's fascinating. But spirit boxes are literally just radios. Yeah. And so that's what always there's just this disconnect where I just didn't like them. Mm -hmm. Plus, they have this really aggressive sound. Yeah, when you're in a so house, sounding. Yeah. Very, it's, 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 nails on uh, a agitating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, so I think in that aspect, maybe it'd be good for, for causing some sort of a psychokinetic manifestation, sure. but I don't think that the- Well, I mean, as a seance worker, I'll tell you, if you're uncomfortable, I'm doing my job, right? Like that's yeah, when you do seance yeah, shows. Exactly. So keeping people standing as opposed to sitting helps because they start rocking and they feel touched. Putting people in total darkness so they lose the horizon definitely helps. There you go. And so any kind of, uh, you know, we can even talk about 19 Hertz infrasound uh, yeah, you know, yeah. right. If, if you can, if you can artificially make your audience a little ill at ease, you've, you've really put them more into that mindset that they're, they're Absolutely. liable to have their own experience. And so I think, yeah, for, for a ghost tour guide, it's a great method for an investigator. I, it's just, uh, yeah. it's just bias. No, you have to throw it out. Um, and, until we until get the these guys, method. right. And what they ended up doing is they ended up uh, putting a blindfold on the, the receiver mm -hmm. who was the person who was using the box, a blindfold, and then these exact headphones, actually. These oh, are nice. Vic Firth drumming headphones. Yeah, drummer these headphones, are my right. Estes Method <laughs> headphones. <laughs> nice. Um, Connor's a drummer in a punk band. Mm -hmm. So when they record, like he has to have special headphones that drown out sound. Right. And so they would blindfold somebody put these headphones on them so they couldn't hear anything. I mean, you're blocking out 20 some decibels worth of sound. So if people are just talking to you in a normal voice with these on, you can't hear them. You only hear the radio. Right. And so someone would sit down and they would start asking questions to this person who's blindfolded and has these noise. Uh, they're not noise canceling headphones. They're noise isolating Isolate. headphones. Mm -hmm. That's important. Mm -hmm. Um, and that person would just say the things that they think they hear coming out of the radio. Right. And I say, think they hear Connor, I think has a different opinion of this. And I'm always careful to make that distinction. Oh, it's okay. 
Um, I personally think what's happening is it's giving your conscious mind something to do while it allows your subconscious mind to slip uh, yeah. actual psychic impressions in sure. that you end up saying because you're you're in a trance like state. You're mm -hmm. basically it's it's channeling. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think to a degree a lot of the time uh, you know, and not everyone's good at this as much as some people are good at it. Some people aren't good at it. But I think that like you were saying, I think that what, what you're sort of seeing is someone being given um, the ability to not worry about what they're saying. That's so if it, they do right. have some kind of an ability, if they are channeling or if there's some kind of latent uh, mediumship that they have, they're not second guessing. They're not second guessing themselves. They're saying what they're hearing. And there's the process of kind of being completely isolated and allowing the, the radio to kind of work them into a trance like state helps them to get in tune with it a little bit more. And it kind of takes the, the pressure off. So, you know, for people who maybe do have abilities or maybe can slip into that trance like state a little bit easier than other people, it instantly makes it 10 times easier for them to tap in and tune in rather than sitting there second guessing what they're thinking is this just me am i you know all, all the pressure that comes along with that right. kind of fades away and of course so that's you, why it's so interesting you, you can't beg the question you can't lead the witness you can't you know exactly. because there's no and that i think is the exactly. there is still you know you can argue that it's still uh there's still uh an interpretation that happens between the speaker and, oh, and the absolutely. receiver and your bias sure. is gonna you know you're gonna interpret whatever they say in the context of the question you just asked but it, yes. it, it takes away that, like I said, that just pure confirmation bias. Yeah. Um, right. And and I think when when you watch these these Estes methods, so there's two in the first season, um, and mm -hmm. then I think two in the second season, and they, right. they get progressively weirder. I feel <laughs> like do. as yes. they go on, right? Um, and so the the first one that you do in the cabin, um, well, what's what's interesting to that? I I wanted to to, to call you out earlier, Dana, one of the other things I love about Hellier as a paranormal documentary uh, is, is sort of your role in it as uh, the sort of metaphysical kind of branch of the team, which is yeah. to say, uh, you know, in that third episode, we watch you set out offerings and light candles and talk about intention uh, mm -hmm. and kind of lead the whole group. Uh, and again, not I, there are paranormal groups hi, that do that, but there are others that don't want anything to do with it. You know, sure. anything yeah. that's woo steals away from that notion that they are full on scientists. And, and so, yeah, right. you know, when, when you immediately start talking about setting intentions and drawing tarot cards and bringing uh, your sort of, um, and I mean this in the, in the, you know, magic with a K sense, your, your low magic into things, right. As mm. opposed to the ceremonial high magic. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's, that's really valuable. And so in that first scene, when you're, when you're out there on the edge of the woods in Kentucky, with this cabin, um, even before you're done with your ritual, you're hearing knocks, you're getting sure. responses, right? Oh, yeah. Of course, wood knocks are a, a, that's a Bigfoot phenomenon. Throwing yeah. rocks is a Bigfoot phenomenon. So we're seeing the same types of stuff happen immediately, but then you kind of retreat off the, the edge of the property back to the porch and you have this estes method and you are more or less having a conversation uh with yeah. her and he can't hear you and it's so when i when i describe that to people and they go oh yeah sure i go no go and watch it it's so because you as the viewer you forget sometimes that he can't hear you oh yeah, oh, right? yeah. <laughs> yeah oh, because, like, because it's like a one one conversation is, right most of the way through uh, you know there's, there's a, a point where you're like i think he tells you to go somewhere and and yes. you're like you're like wait go here we're we're here already here and he's like no there 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 it is right and he's like yeah, yeah like I mean it's literally you're like here and he says no there right yeah um, there were moments in that that Estes method session specifically where Connor would uh, tell us that something was going to happen like ten seconds before it was a lot so of he yeah, would, precognition he would, he would point us in a direction and say, you know, sound commotion or something. It was something along the lines of that. And it happened a few times and we, it, all it would take for, you know, we would literally just look in that direction and like clockwork a couple mm -hmm. seconds later, the sound would happen. And, and, you know, there was that on top of the fact that like, you know, you mentioned it there, we were just having a complete conversation. There were so many moments where uh, it's easy to forget that Connor has no idea what is going on he's just saying what he hears well the the, he's, you the, know, the he's so in it. best example of that is the one that you've got in in season two 
um, which I'll just say, you know, about the tones. Um, yes, because, yeah, I mean, yeah. it, it, again, it's a point where literally uh, uh, Greg and a couple of the other guys are singing in this game. And, yes. and as soon as they're done, you've got your blindfolds and your headphones, and your helmet on, and you're like, yeah, just like that. Uh huh. Like, just yeah. as if you're teaching them how to do it, even though yeah. you can't hear them, they don't know what you're experiencing. It's, it's, it's really something. Uh, mm -hmm. blew me away as a ghost hunter uh, because I thought I'd, you know, it's one of those, oh, I've seen all the, the tech uh, and then yeah, to see right. this method. So, so this, this person that said, you know, what's, um, it, what, how do you feel about spirit boxes? My, my response was, I hate them, <laughs> but there's this show called Hellier that you really ought to watch, <laughs> right? Because that's a good method. Um, and so I think that that kind of is where we leave it at, at season one. There's a lot of synchronicities and I think there's a lot of meaning uh, especially for y'all uh, going yeah. through it um, and and sort of for, for some of us that are viewing. Uh, but as far as a resolution at the end of those first five, um, it, it just doesn't really come to that. And in fact, I think the last scenes are something I would talk about where literally it's, it's all of you talking about what your experience was. And I think there's this feeling that this might be all that was. Like there might not have been a season oh. two. Oh, yeah, hundred percent. Right. Like the, the the crazy thing about season one is, we started shooting season two before season one was finished, mm -hmm. and so it had a different ending. Like season one had a completely different ending because we thought, well, this is it, mm -hmm. and the the whole thing was is very very cliche. But like the joke has become, I think Carl even made the joke. Uh, maybe maybe the <laughs> the real goblins were the friends, oh, the we, friends made we made the along the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was really the point of it was it was just this little project that we made that we thought you know we we enjoyed it we yeah. enjoyed what the the process was and we what it of, showed people yeah we show the ins and outs of paranormal investigation and how sometimes you don't come to the conclusions you thought you were going to sometimes you do hit a lot of dead ends sometimes weirder stuff happens than what you thought was going to happen and it felt like we were okay if, with it at that we, point we were, were like, just oh, like right, when you watch the last it. bit of it you see us just rationalizing like all this time that we just wasted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's not necessarily, not really, but that's kind of the joke. Like it's a beautiful, it was a beautiful uh, it was experience. A fun adventure. We, we really did get to know some of our best friends doing it. Mm -hmm. And we had really weird experiences that even now we have trouble rationalizing. Like, right. you know, Connor's tin can experience was a humongous deal for him. Especially um, for him. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, and so there was a lot of stuff that came out of that, that made us, better investigators for one mm -hmm. but we just thought like okay this is it this is what we've got then the email from right. amy came in right well which... so i i, I want to before we get to amy i want to zero in on one thing so um greg it's it's you you're talking to tenny there at the end um yeah. uh john tenny and and you ask him and it's almost you can you can see i think as the viewer that, that you can see you grappling with it where you you're like i don't know what done looks like at this point like, and you know, the unspoken thing is, I mean, wasn't I supposed to present a goblin? Like, what the hell do I do now? Oh, sure. right? Are we done? Right. right. And, and Tenny tells you two things in response. The first thing he says, uh, I think we prove it. He says, oh, you're never done. You'll never be done. Yeah. Like this yeah. rabbit hole just keeps going. And that's one of the things that I've been saying for the last two months is that that's true. I think of all these paranormal rabbit holes, oh, you're only done when you pull back and say, I've had enough. I can't go any further. Yeah. Um, and and then he he says i think the the other side of that coin is he says oh you're you're never done and my concern is that if you if you keep chasing it you'll go crazy yeah because yeah. it happens to everybody sooner or later and yeah. and particularly when he said that of course uh, as a 14 guy my mind goes immediately to john keel right yeah. and, oh, and yeah. you know oh, john yeah. keel of Absolutely. course who yeah, I mean, basically lost his mind, it lost his mind. But I mean, first, if, if you don't know John Keel by name, y'all, you know, that's the guy that does all the Mothman prophecies things. Uh, he's one of the first real investigators that has run in after run in after run in with the men in black. Uh, so, you know, that concept of the men in black really comes from Point Pleasant, the Mothman and everything that was going around there. He gets weird phone calls. He gets, I mean, you know, a, a, a John Keel doppelganger starts popping up right. at certain conventions. Um, yeah, and, and so one of the phone calls even predicted the bridge collapse. Yeah. Right, and so there's still, I think, some question in the community as to whether or not, it, you know, is Keel the target of sort of supernatural harassment, or was this, uh, you know, kind of a, a co-intel pro, you know, kind of counterintelligence, 
uh, um, alphabet agency sort of thing going after Keel. But but either way, the result is the same. By the end of it, Keel's saying, I wish I'd never done any of this. Like, exactly. I, I want out. Um, yeah. and, and I'll say, I it, it, it breaks my heart uh, to think about that because I do think if you stay in it long enough, that's kind of where you're looking at. We're all going to be old and, and just a little crazy. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and again, I love them to pieces, but Alan <clears throat> Greenfield would be um, a great example of that. You know, Alan's still, he's, he's together, but when you talk think, to him, he's in his own world too. You know, he exists in his own paradigm. and that's, I think Alan's crazy like a fox. Right, so. exactly. That's what I mean. Not I crazy that, that he's lost it. The eternal trickster. Right. Yeah, and sure. what's funny about this is where he says, you're never done and we're, I'm worried you'll go crazy. Uh, if you needed more proof that Tenny had a little bit of prophecy to him. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. Yeah. Then we turn to season two. So I wrote on my little note cards here. You know, I said, Hell Your One is mostly, it, it starts with these emails about the goblins. And then it sort of develops into this exploration of that weird area of Kentucky. But that's more yeah. or less what it's about. You can say it's about synchronicity yeah. and goblins and, and good, solid paranormal investigation. Sure. Yeah. yeah. In Hellier Season 2, we get oh, into <clears throat> <laughs> Secret Ciphers, John Keel, Mothman, UFOs, Indrid Cold, Woody Derenberger, Black Helicopters, Aleister Crowley, Occultist, Spirit Channeling, Fairies, The Green Man, Little Green Man, Cults, Kidnapping, Alien Abductions, God Helmets, Euphonauts, and Secret Chiefs. Did I miss anything, <laughs> right? I mean, like, it's... Ancient a... gods, maybe. Yeah, yeah right, gods. exactly. <laughs> right. Oh, and, and you weren't... Uh, you, Dan, you, you didn't come on, but I showed um, Greg. I don't know if it's still at the top. Yeah, I drew a fairy's oracle card for this interview just before. Oh, you did? I did. Have any guesses? Was it uh, pan-related? Uh, well, I mean, it, it, she's a woman in that one, but the green woman. The green woman. <laughs> decided to pop up. Oh, my gosh. Right? That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so synchronicity still hanging around. Um, but I don't even – because I have y'all for such a, a limited time um, – I, I almost don't want to dig into season two the way we dig into season one. Um, I, I do sure. want to, let, let's talk about that email that, that sends you kind of on that. And then we'll, we'll touch on some things and then kind of, kind of switch subjects here. A few months after shooting season one, you know, we, everything was all wrapped up. Um, but this was before this, we actually had put it out. So this, yeah. everything was still, no, no mm -hmm. one had any idea. What we had, there was a working. long gap between finishing season one and, and actually Releasing. putting it out because we mm -hmm. were trying to figure out what to do with it because it wasn't what we thought we were, we had been making. Sure, so sure. we did, we just went back and forth. There were a couple of networks that were interested, but they wanted us to actually find goblins. And so, <laughs> right. you know, there's the whole ethical questions of that world and we weren't comfortable with it. And so, you know, there was, there were people who wanted to reshoot the entire thing over again. Um, and I'm sure make something happen. Yeah. Oh, right. And so we just were like, screw it. Why can't we just put it out ourselves? Mm -hmm. And that's what we decided to do. And so as we're finishing, we had one final shot to shoot. Oh, that's right. We had yeah. one final shot and that's the actual goblin, uh, in the intro. Oh, okay. And Tyler was here. And we shot this scene where uh, it's act was shot on our kitchen table. It's ruined <laughs> right. because of all the paint. Tyler's menace. and it's uh, it's it's you know just the light sweeping on it. And Carl walks in the room and he's like, "That's it. Yeah. That's a wrap." That's Carl's a wrap so on excited. Hellier. He's like, "We're done. Like we did the thing. We did Guys, the thing. It's, it's awesome. over. That's a wrap is, on Hellier. Complete." Is so this the like, moment where you're like, "Sit down, Carl." <laughs> yes, that is it. We had just finished shooting. This, the, the, first, the last scene. I love it. Poor Carl and we so sat him complete. down and I slapped down these emails that I had agonized over. The only person I had told was Tyler mm -hmm. because he was sort of an extra outside the circle party at that point. And there was a very weird, very strange and intense synchronicity that happened around the timing oh. of this these second set of emails coming in that had a lot to do with Tyler yeah. her, in the moment going to a, a location that to do some recon yeah. that was Hellier related. Yeah. So it was, it I mean, it's it, what, the way that it happened. Hours. This isn't much of a spoiler, but um, those coordinate points, we were never, we, that's one thing we didn't follow up on in mm -hmm. season one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Tyler was like, I'm, I'm off school. Let me go check this out. And we're like, you know what? Fine. So we gave him the coordinate points 
Right. And he was preparing to go. He was at the laundromat, <laughs> washing his clothes, getting ready to go. And I, I get an email. Rolled in. And the email is all about, you're on their radar. They're watching. This is from someone completely unrelated. We've never heard of her before. The right. second uh, the second set of emails pretty much gave us everything that the first ones didn't. It was like details, locations, uh, her name, her birth date, like her driver's license. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Every, every problem we had with season one with David Christie didn't exist with this person. Mm -hmm. And it was like the trigger words were there, like euphonauts, um, uh, slough was Sluff in there. is a crazy, yeah. All of these things were there that should not have been there. Secret and I, people that she, you were trying to tell her to communicate with us. And, and I lost my mind yeah. because I, I was like, oh my God, it's happening again. Yeah. This is happening again. And it's happening right before, like the scary ass emails happening right before our friend drives Literally down drives to, to check the, out yeah. these things by himself in the North Carolina forest. And mm -hmm. at this point, you know, with this second set of emails, so much of it was about a large group of people being involved in, in it. And so we instantly get very paranoid, very conspiracy brain kicks in. And, yeah. and again, at the time, like the timing of those emails, the fact that Tyler was literally driving out, uh, you know, alone little to, green men to this place, there. little green men. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To, to this place, uh, he by himself really sent us all the three of us into a tailspin of complete like paranoia. We were well, so and, and there's absolutely something to be said for, you know, like, don't get me wrong. I think I would be terrified to see an actual goblin crawl out of a cave somewhere, oh, but, yeah. but I'm way more scared of humans. People than are, goblins or Bigfoots or ghosts or, or yeah, anything else. Absolutely. They're always the scariest. Well, and so the longest shot, and this is more or less the opening of the, of the second season. You get these emails that allege uh, uh, cult conspiracies and, and murders and abductions and human sacrifice. I mean, like just everything you could imagine is packed yeah. into that email. And that is just before uh, uh, the, the inimitable Tyler Strand heads out finds this random spot uh, that these coordinates lead him to. As soon as he finds the spot, he's buzzed by a black helicopter. I mean, a literal unmarked black helicopter yeah. that goes straight over his head in the middle of the woods. Uh, and then when he finally manages to emerge from the woods, you know, after several other kind of trials, um, kind of emerges in this place and, and then summarily gets run out of town by undercover police uh, yeah. who are like, we don't take kindly to strangers around the, I mean, it's so, it's so bizarre. Um, yeah. It's like he suddenly just walked into David Lynch world and yeah. you know, everybody's in on it. Uh, and in the meantime, of course, his phone's gone dead and his GPS isn't working. And you know, y'all are just outside of Cincy going, please pick up the phone, you know, like don't, yeah, don't yeah. be dead. I was right. guiding him. I was, I was sick as a dog. I remember so clear. I was so sick, some sicker I've been so long and I'm in bed. And he's like on the phone with his dying phone and he'd swiped off of his, uh, his, his, his GPS. Yeah. <laughs> so he didn't know what direction he was going. And so I'm, I'm, and he didn't have, he didn't have a good enough signal for the map to load again. Right. And so I'm sitting there on the computer trying to guide him out of this forest as it's getting dark and starting to rain. Yeah. And it's and a national like, forest. I mean, yeah, don't go yeah. north. You'll be in Blair Witch country forever. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, it's, and be, Tyler being Tyler, which, you know, is he's ridiculous and he's there in the cold without a jacket on or any kind of outdoor clothing. He looked cool because he has be a really look, good looking. He corpse. has to look really good, but he can't. You know, no winter jacket or gloves very, or anything. Yeah, so all that we're guy. all that you know we're worried about is him literally wandering wandering into a national forest without a jacket in the middle of you know freezing cold temperatures and and with a dead phone and it was just the worst <laughs> it was the worst we'll it, thankfully yeah. he's okay <laughs> if you if, if you've never met tyler strand he he's got the soul of an artist uh yeah. the look of a late 90s rock front man yes. <laughs> and the enthusiasm of a six-month-old golden retriever yeah, uh, I mean that's, that's the man in a nutshell. That's very true. That, right? That's a pretty good description of Tyler. I think you might have nailed it. Solid. Right. Except instead of chasing sticks, it's it's flares. Goblins. Uh, yeah. yeah, goblins yeah, yeah, and flare guns. guns. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable.
Um, and that's literally, I mean, you know, we, we just covered four or five crazy conspiratorial topics and that's the first five minutes of, of episode one. Um, yeah. and, and it, it, it goes so far, uh, kind of off the rails into uncharted territory. And I think that is one of its draws is that you're off the map. We don't know what's going to happen next. You can't even, even if you're a, a student of paranormal stuff, you can't predict what's going to happen because it is so out there. Um, you it's know, insane. by the time you get to Somerset, Kentucky, and now we've got perhaps literal secret societies or cults or, or some dangerous human activity going on, while at the same time we've got all of these connections uh, to Somerset, England, and the Fay folk. And, um, and, and again, any friend of mine knows that I think the only difference between aliens and fairies is what time period you're, you're talking about. Oh, 100%. Uh, right? I mean, yeah. yeah. If, if you don't know all of the similarities between alien abductions and the old, old, like real fairy tales, mm -hmm. uh, number one, you need to go and read everything Joshua Cutchin has ever written. Mm -hmm. um, sure. And then once you've done that, you know, there's a few other things that, that I could recommend. But Passport to Magonia. Oh, my right? gosh. Passport to Magonia Ballet, is a great yeah. one. Right. Um, um, yeah, exactly. Jacques Vallée and, and Josh and everybody. But, you know, and so, of course, if you're if you're exploring something that has ufo overtones you can shade that in just a little different way and have it be fey overtones instead but in in this case it's it's everything it's the layers it's because it's the synchronicities it gets to the point where um you know we're referencing john keel and all the mothman uh, uh prophecies and that's linked up uh, and what's strange oh, yeah. about that is that suddenly you know you get to the exploration of injured cold and and now all of a sudden we have name synchronicities to every last one of you there's a relevant Carl and Connor and y'all are the new Kirks and you know all of these uh, these things going on um, and, and it's it's baffling to see how much of that is is packed into it um, and then by the time we get towards the end uh, as I said the last Estes method se session with Tyler um, mm -hmm. I don't think was a, a communication session so much as a trance possession going on. I mean, he, he kind of went full bore channel there. Uh, and it's really something to watch uh, because I find a lot of the full born channels that you see like on YouTube are probably, I, I, again, I want to say 90% of them are just people faking something good for the camera. Sure, sure. You know, again, no I disrespect mean, to the people that are out there doing it legitimately, but to the watch thing that's his- The funny so about funny Tyler too funny. is we've done uh, oh, ask yeah. the sessions with him in the past, and he, he's, he's really bad at it. <laughs> he's horrible. Like, they, like the, fun, that's the funniest like, thing is, like, Tyler, when we were like, maybe you should do this, yeah. he was like, oh, I don't know, I'm not We've very good at it. We've done and, and they're just like, there's, they're just kind of, yeah, they're just hit. They're, they're, just kind of, they're just kind of boring. Yeah. There's just not much going on there. And it was like the second we used the Frank's box, he like plugged into something just and was, was not, not the there. same. He was a very, on top of the fact that he also, another really weird detail that I don't think made it into Hallier, and I just, maybe because we didn't talk about it, is I'm sitting next to him physically and I can feel the heat. Temperature. Oh, see, I wanted to ask you about this. Body. So if I know. If we put a flare on him, he would have lit it up because I could feel, I could feel the heat actually emanating in waves off of his body. It was unreal. Well, I'm hoping my friend uh, Marjorie is still in the comment section because she and I have been talking about this uh, for, for months and months now. Um, so, you know, we have a unique perspective. Uh, Marjorie is a mambo, a voodoo priestess. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a voodoo practitioner. We've been to lots of rituals. And of course, one of the big aspects of voodoo is spirit possession. I mean, it's just sure. part of the religion. And, and so I was telling Greg, uh, that was me that asked that question about trans mediumship at the con when y'all did the, the panel. Uh, yeah. Because we've been, we've been talking about that since we saw it. Because to our perspective, we just watched someone be what we call ridden by a spirit. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why I asked. Because in, in voodoo, when you look at that, there are uh, uh, several kind of physical experiences and, and other phenomena that you couldn't translate across a, a video, but yeah. that might have happened that would check more boxes that would lead me to think, oh, well, this was definitely some kind of transpossession. And one yeah. of those is big temperature fluctuations, internal, external. We talk about yeah. spirits being hot in voodoo, mm -hmm. you know, like you say, oh, that's a hot spirit and you'll get yeah. warm. The other one is one he talks about that, that he says when the Estes session was over, he felt as if something kind of 
uncoiled around his leg. Like somebody leg. pulled a ribbon. Yeah, and it went, right? And yep. I was like, yep. So there was a literal sense of physical leaving as that came mm -hmm. to an end. And so I really do think y'all y'all had a, a happy little visitation there. And then I, as, yeah. as I was telling I mean, Greg, you know, you can kind of decide what who that spirit was and what their real intentions were. But I think that's that's been up for debate. Yeah. And I think that just, you know, like and I mean, Tyler, it says Michael, but even Tyler, Tyler probably would be the first to tell you that that's not who he necessarily thinks it was. Yeah, right. But again, I think that's the thing. It is it's up to interpretation of, of uh, the person, I think, observing what's but going see, on. But see, like you being a voodoo practitioner, mm -hmm. This this conversation right now is exactly why people should be crossing lines yeah. exactly, between right. different different uh, outlets because mm -hmm. someone who's just like a a ufologist and experiences something like that's gonna be like oh okay oh that was weird yeah. who knows what it was or well, somebody psychological who's just like a ghost or right absolutely hypnotic so, suggestion who knows right. You would never know that there's these crossover similarities because like, I don't know, my, my outlook, particularly with like, with anything we do, hellier or otherwise is let's hang out with all the weirdos we can right. because <laughs> every big, crazy breakthrough we've ever had mm -hmm. has come from someone else. Yeah. It's not come from us. And, and I think we get a lot of credit for that sometimes, but it's because we're just Someone else has had the answer. We just mm -hmm. uh, care to ask. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, and, I mean, and, that and is how, how you and I connected in the first place. You know, you say that in season, uh, no, it's not in season two, it's in a, uh, another interview. Uh, yeah. But you say, you know, like people kept asking us, how on earth did you get access to, you know, Alan and, and, and everybody else? And you're like, we, we just yes. emailed them and asked them. They were happy yeah. to talk. Yeah. I think so, people just have this mental block about it where they're like, oh, well, this person is a, a, a ritual might. magician. I, they're not going to be interested or whatever, yes. but I think you, and, and, and here's the thing, they not, they aren't always interested, mm -hmm. but I think the ones who you are meant to connect to, all you got to do is ask and they're going to see it too. Right. Um, it's um, so important. Right. Well, and, and I mean, I don't know how to put this into words, right? Like not only is it important to have that kind of cross pollination with, with weirdos, but I think the other, I mean, speaking for myself, um, I know, especially since, season two dropped. You know, I'm sure y'all got your share of, I know what's going on in hell, your emails after season oh, one, yeah, yeah, yeah. but season two, I mean, just cracks it wide open. And so I'm sure they came out of the woodwork. Uh, yes. And so speaking as one of those people with, I, I felt like grounded theories that I could support with, with evidence and citations. Mm. I was still reluctant to send an email because I understood there was so much noise uh, that was mm -hmm. already present that, you know, are you just going to be dismissed as, one more person with a hell your theory or, or kind of move to the spam. Well, I mean, I mean, or... and that, that's the thing is, mm -hmm. is I, I, this is actually a great opportunity to say this is no one's really dismissed. No, mm -hmm. like we, we, we keep track of everything. I have a binder. That's just everything. There's a physical copy of everything people send us mm -hmm. and there's regardless usually... of, of how, whether we believe it or not, yeah. because you never know, like when you're looking for these oh connections, my God, we you... don't throw anything. No, out. no, never. And so like, when I say, I, I was I was joking earlier. I've heard from a dozen Terry wrists. <laughs> right, point, right, right. But I think there's something that's interesting about Hellier in particular, which whether this becomes a plot point later or not, I, I don't know. Like we don't even know what the future of Hellier is. But there seems to be this thing where even the people who are trying to mess with us, and there's plenty of them, right. and we're pretty good at sniffing them out at this point even the people who are trying to mess with us are compelled to put information in their correspondence with us that leads us to something real. Well, good, good. And that's what's so strange about this is I think even the people who don't have real information mm -hmm. and when we, you know, this, or they're act actively trying to, or deceive they're actively us. trying to deceive yeah. us somehow. There's, they're being compelled mm -hmm. by something. Exactly. If if still have some useful information in their correspondences. Well, if we're accepting that there is, you know, whatever intelligence or phenomena that is guiding uh, these emails and and these events and setting up these synchronicities, uh, you know, it stands to reason that it can do that, whether or not you believe in it. Uh, yeah, and so, yeah. you know, it moves Absolutely. those hoaxers into the right place as well. Um, and of course, you know, we could we could talk for another hour about. 
um, the idea of tulpas and the notion that, you know, give a hoax enough energy and it's not a hoax anymore. I mean, look at, look at Slender Man, you know, that's a, that's a great example Absolutely. of that. Absolutely. Um, and so even there, I think there's, there's some value. Uh, but let's dig into that. So I'm looking at my clock and I realized, yeah, I, I really did think I could fit a whole bunch into two hours. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. Um, so, so I want to, I want to kind of speak to the audience real quick. Uh, oh, Teresa Castile just said, this is riveting and we'll be checking out Hellier. Um, I'm glad I saw, yeah, we've got a, a, one of our watchers from, from Ireland who has come nice. every, every show we've done, she's been here and, and it's like three in the morning in I Ireland right now. It's so late. I don't know. Um, but, but she's here all the time. And, and so I definitely want to dig into to some of this other stuff that I've got. So let me do some, some admin stuff real quick. Uh, Craig, we talked about it before the interview and then I totally forgot to announce it to everybody. Um, as we have done every show, uh, we want to give you all the opportunity to donate any money you like into our little Venmo tip jar. Uh, again, that's not for me or any of the owners. That goes straight to all of our unemployed tour guides. Uh, as this is the last time uh, we're going to do this, at least for maybe a month or so, uh, this is your last opportunity to help them out. So we wanted to do something really cool. Um, as a result, um, Greg and I have worked it out, and any admission or excuse me, any, any contribution will throw your name into a hat. Uh, and here in, I'm going to say 40 minutes or so, we'll draw a name. Uh, and that person will get the entire season one Blu-ray of Hellier, uh, as well as some stickers and some cool stuff. Uh, and you'll earn, you'll even earn my jealousy because I don't have any of those stickers. Uh, so, right. I'm waiting for uh, Tyler to make more goblin heads. That's, uh, that's my next, I think, investment. He's working on it. Um, so, uh, Tyler. so please, Tyler time. <laughs> uh, I know that I know that Angela will probably put the Venmo. Uh, that's at No Secrets Tours uh, in the comments one more time for y'all. And I mean it. I know some of y'all have been so cool about donating every every episode. So if you throw a dollar, I don't I don't care. Anything that goes in, hell, your season one and some stickers. Somebody will get them. Um, but I'll throw. You know what? Because I oh, because okay. I think that's such a cool idea. I'll, I'll throw in a hellier baseball cap too yeah oh, you son of a bitch so you're gonna be and now i'm even more jealous because i also don't have a hell of your baseball cap. No. Oh, so. and here's the other thing they stopped making them so this is one of the only times you can get one of oh, these oh, it, like a, it looks like our uh oh james corbin won the drawing so congratulations everybody um so you just just tell them that the new kirks forgot to put the baseball cap in this when yeah, they sent it to me i don't know what don't happened. do it because you got it on record right yeah, now that's, that's it. not well, what happened it's live it's been said be so I, I want to move to, um, to to kind of the takeaways from season two. So we're going to, I mean, no matter what we've said so far, I can promise everyone on the feed that if you haven't <laughs> seen the last episode, whatever you're picturing is wrong. Um, I mean, it goes to such a strange place uh, at the end. Uh, and so I, I kind of want to talk a, a little bit about that. So, um, you know, you, you talk in large part about Hellier itself, the very act of making the documentary and sharing it with the public uh, to be a sort of ritual in and yeah. of itself, or, or the word that keeps coming up is initiation. Uh, yeah. and, and certainly I can, I can vouch for that on the receiving end, because again, as soon as I saw it, I was hooked. I was like, I've got to investigate this, even if the Newkirks don't want anything to do with me and my emails get, <laughs> you know, printed out and then never read again. I have to look at this stuff. Uh, and there's there's at least two other people. One, my friend Marjorie, who's who's the Mambo, um, and then my friend Kia, who's also in the comments thread. Uh, that I've kind of forcibly sat down and made watch season mm -hmm. one, and then said, okay, now that you're hooked, watch season two and get back to me. Um, yeah. And so there's definitely this sense of of initiation, and even the act of watching it, we find is is kind of connecting people to the paranormal and kind of hooking them in. Uh, but what I want to talk about is that every team member went through an initiation as well uh, when yeah. he went through this. And and Greg, I think you're probably the biggest example uh, of this, right? Because we, we kind of start with you being the um, <laughs> more of the, the, the scully of the pair, right? Like every time I thought about y'all before, Andy, I mean, Dana starts out being a witch, so we know she believes yeah. in magic and, and, sure, and yeah. some stuff. And Greg, you tend to try to try to be the, the rational, you know, sort of more logical. I try. Right, right. Um, as much as you can for someone 
with a living like this. Right, yeah. exactly, exactly. <laughs> we do our best. Um, but by the end of it, uh, I think you're, you're doing things and trying methods that, let's say, no materialist investigator uh, would mm. give the time no, of day. No, I don't think so. Um, and especially- I mean, I, 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 talk, I tell people I am not the same person that I was going into that cave mm-hmm. at, the, at the end of season two. I said it before. Uh, uh, I'm not the same person I was when I left. Well, and that's the definition of initiation right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. You went in sure. one thing and you came out something else. Um, but I do think we see it kind of in, in other team members as well. So I know like mm-hmm. the documentary touches on um, Connor and his faith a little bit. Yeah. You know, I, you don't dig into that too much. But um, he's a, as I understand it, a devout Catholic. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. and, and living in a very Catholic state and having come from, from, you know, Christian background, um, yep. some of the things that are pursued when you look down these occult paths, especially when we get to season two and we're talking about Aleister Crawley and oh, yeah. high ceremonial magic rituals and things like that. I mean, these are all things that are more or less black and white verboten from a, from a Catholic oh, point sure. of view. And, and so to see him, reconcile those things right and and he does it i think a couple of times very well on camera you know vocalizes it uh to the viewing audience i think that's impressive i think there's a there's yeah. an initiation that we see a, a change in somebody um i would have been until this last week i'd have been harder pressed to say the same thing about dana uh, mm-hmm. because Dana, i think you you go in a witch you come out a witch you know it's not yeah. like we don't see a, a religious conversion or anything else, except that as I did some some background research, um, it's interesting to me, and, and I'm going to float a theory. You can tell me whether or not I'm on base. Yeah. I think that the Hellier experience, um, if it didn't change the, the way you fundamentally think about the metaphysical world, mm-hmm. it, it supercharged how often you relate to the world in that way. Uh, And so here's like, here's what I'll say. Uh, This is 2017 that we're talking about, right? When all this Mm -hmm. is going down. Uh, And I just noticed because you were kind enough to catalog everything this week, uh, Mm -hmm. the first magic of the month offering comes out in 2017. Mm -hmm. And so we see a a correlation there. Um, We we talked briefly about there is um, these three musical tones that show up in season two that become very, very important. And I still, it is one of those mysteries that as a viewer, I'm not a hundred percent satisfied with yet. I think there's still, yeah, yeah, we still haven't yet gotten to the bottom of that particular Mm -hmm. mystery, Uh, but it's very much connected to you. Uh, And then I know in the last year um, you've picked up singing bowls and Mm -hmm. now you're doing these beautiful um, sound bath meditations and lots of of tonal work. (laughs) Right. Um, and so I, I see these changes in you as well. They're just, I think, I think more subtle, uh, you, you know, you, you got to connect the dots a little bit. Um, yeah, it, I think so for sure. A hundred percent. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, that's, that's, that's one thing is that just to be able to watch investigators get changed by their investigations, again, I think sets y'all apart, uh, from most paranormal documentaries, paranormal TV shows. Uh, most people pick a character and then stick with it. Yeah. Um, and I, well, and I, I think that's tough because then you've got to be that character in public all the time. Yeah. Sure, right. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think know it, both... it's an interesting way of looking at it, it really, really is. like mm-hmm. saying that to, to see us change as the investigation changes, because I hadn't really thought about it like that, but it's really actually very true. I think even, even, t- I mean, t- all of us, got, yeah. you know, we do, we have really changed quite a bit throughout the course of the, you know, the changing of the investigation. So that's a really interesting way to kind of look at it, I think. Well, I'm, I'm wondering too, uh, and it's in my notes a little later on, but let's see what I, let's see if I wrote down anything that was actually salient. Oh, I did. I wrote down a whole question. How nice of me. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, I, we're going to get into the museum and, and Magic of the Month and, and the Patreon in just a second, but um, I came to it because of sort of coronavirus. I mean, the, the whole reason we're doing these interviews uh, is because of COVID. And I know y'all put together the con and have, have, have been working really, really hard producing daily content for your Patreon people while everybody is stuck at home. Uh, but, but in a metaphysical sense, and Dan, I'm going to direct the, the question to you. Um, do you think that the coronavirus itself, that this act of quarantine, um, 
one of its major functions to me, it seems like, is that it created this liminal space yeah. that extended for way longer than we're used to these sorts of between oh, moments yeah. being. Um, and I think that I said, uh, you know, has it created the mother of all liminal spaces to make these sort of changes and magic in the world? And specifically what I'm talking about here, and I think maybe this is something that Hellier perhaps brought to the forefront for you. I think it was present already, but this notion of uh, re-enchantment. Yeah, right? absolutely. Um, is trying to, to re-enchant the world. And I, I will comment now, since I brought up the keyword, uh, there's a good, good friend of mine that I'm sure is watching uh, that I feel I need y'all to connect virtually for two reasons. One, 15 years ago, this good friend of mine was, was preaching the same philosophy, talking about re-enchanting the world, bringing magic back, etc. Uh, and I think both of y'all must have had the same good teacher uh, because she is the only person I know uh, that I think could hold a candle to you in overall Lord of the Rings knowledge. Oh! Uh, I, I, I'll be Sounds honest. Like I know those are bold Hello. words. It's bold to say. And trust me, she's on the other end, wherever she's watching, making the same <laughs> face the same about y'all. Right. A fellow Tolkien scholar, oh, I see. I mean, scholar is the, the lowest way of saying that. <laughs> Putting you two together in a room would be like watching Stephen Colbert and Viggo Mortensen hang That's out and geek true. about That's stuff. That's true. Right? Um, I am, I am an uh, enormous Lord of the Rings nerd, and I feel as if uh, my goal in life is to bring Middle Earth to uh, the current state of the world. I, <laughs> I, would love it. I would love to just live out all my elvish dreams, <laughs> honestly. I feel like I'm getting pretty close to it, actually. Yeah. So but I agree with you about um, about what, what this experience of isolation and uh, it's been very, it's, it's, it's been incredibly tough for a lot of people aside from the fact that the obvious, you know, uh, people losing jobs and, and people getting ill and living in a state of fear and panic all the time. But there's a sense, I think that quite a few people, a lot of people are realizing that, that isolation and that sense of having to be alone was, is really difficult. And that, you know, a lot of the stimulus that, that kind of can eat into your life was instantly taken away cold turkey people had to be in their homes right. and i'm quite a few uh quite a few people i think have looked at this time and i and i'm not the only person there's a lot of other people who've kind of come to the same conclusions but that this liminal state has really given us permission and space and uh and the time to turn inward and and to start thinking about the state of our lives and and what really does need to change mm -hmm. and what needs to change to to fulfill us because all this shit that we've been stuffing in you know the the empty parts of ourselves we we can't really we can go back to doing that after this to a degree yeah, if we but wouldn't to. it be so much better to to heal it and to, to, again, return to a sense of, uh, I really love, you know, referring to it as re-enchanting yourself and re-enchanting the world and bringing mm -hmm. a, a, a memory. Because I think for most people living magically and, and feeling re-enchanted is more about remembering it than kind of having to just figure out how to do it. And I think that a lot of people are, are, have used this time to remember how to be re to to re-enchant themselves to live magically to mm -hmm. uh to not limit themselves because it's it's everywhere mm -hmm. and uh that this time and space has given everybody i think a lot of time to reflect on that and to start really working towards bringing that about and then how wonderful will it be if we live you know in a country and in a world where people are back to their enchanted states and their magical states and and the world becomes a lot more fun and a lot more Absolutely. you know spiritual fulfilling at mm -hmm. that point but yeah i think that's a really great point um and i would hope that that's what, what uh, the conclusions that some people have come to right well we talk so often um both i know on this show and in 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 y'all's kind of line as well about this idea of the liminal spaces being where not mm -hmm. just magic, but where really the paranormal. Oh yeah, happens. sure. I mean, we can talk about that that letter from Amy and sort of the fact that Amy exists on the fringes of society. And, yeah. You know that that you know that spawns a conversation about who are the people that typically see paranormal phenomena. Why yeah, is it know. always these people that are you know either homeless or maybe in some kind of trouble or you know we joke the ones that are out every night at three a.m. 
are going to see the things that are walking around at 3 a.m. Oh, of but, course, yeah. But, but who is it really that's walking around every night at 3 a.m.? It's not your typical, you know, average Joe. It's, it's these mm-hmm. sort of fringe groups. And so it's, I think it's, it's going to be a unique, I hope, a unique event in our lifetime where the material world just got put on pause for two months. Yeah. And, well, and I think and, one, of the, one of the things we talk about in season two is the idea of what an initiation is mm-hmm. yes. and, and, and the things that you need to have an initiation. And, and I think you, you use that word and you, you assume it's like rogue people in the dark. Or whatever, <laughs> right. But we go through as human beings, as initiations all the time, you know, like your 16th birthday is an initiation. You get to, to get the keys to the car, man. Mm-hmm. You know, you're a 40, uh, 40 years old is an initiation. You get the camera up your butt. <laughs> you know, it's, there's, there's a midlife crisis. That's an yeah. initiation. Yeah, yeah. All those things are initiatory experiences. We just don't see them that way. But the biggest initiations have something called communitas. And it is something that people try and replicate. Brands have tried to replicate it. They mm-hmm. can't. It is only something... It is a big experience that bonds people together. It's a shared experience. Guys who've gone to war together, right? They know what that is. They have a brotherhood forever. Um, people who've gone through traumatic experiences together. People who have, you know, gone through different types of training. The New York blackouts is one of the biggest examples mm-hmm. of people who have that shared sense of communitas. If you don't think we're going to come out of Corona virus Mm -hmm. with a massive sense of communitas whenever this thing blows over and it's over we're going to talk about it all the time and we're going to know what each other went through Mm -hmm. during that period um and that right there is a massive indicator of an initiatory experience and so that's what i think is happening now these groups yeah you're absolutely right I was going to say, you know, one of the reasons and i kept saying this and i still it's it's sort of i want to keep pinching myself where i'm like how on earth am I sitting down and having a two hour long conversation with Greg and Dana Newkirk? Like, how did that happen? Um, <laughs> you asked. And the answer yeah. is coronavirus, you know, like, but that's, I mean, without, without that impetus, without COVID having prompted this, I'd have never even tried to broadcast, oh, which yeah, means I wouldn't absolutely. need interviews, which would, and so there is this, um, if, if you'll pardon the metaphor, um, I've been saving this one for a while. <laughs> coronavirus hit and all us weirdos suddenly kind of by ourselves at our home just decided to kind of randomly fire our flare guns into the dark woods of the, <laughs> the internet and just see who responded yeah, and, sure. and right and but because it was that in the dark i think the people that did respond there's there's so much more of a, of a common wavelength uh and so yes. that's that's really i'll say though i have have for a long time, admired y'all's work from afar. Uh, what got me kind of close enough to to feel like, oh, I could just email them and ask if they wanted to interview, um, was not only becoming an actual member of of the museum, uh, but also uh, PhenomenaCon, which happened mm-hmm. uh, about a month ago. Uh, so yeah. what a what a good segue you just tossed at me, Greg. Thank you. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, so I want to talk about the museum specifically in a minute, um, but. Fans of the show will know we've taken one week off since we began, uh, and that was the weekend of PhenomenaCon because I was not going to do a Friday night episode I if I was, was at the convention. Yeah. Uh, so I just said, "Hey, I'm taking a week off. I'll be back next week." Um, and then I got to basically do this, what we're doing now, uh, for three days, eight hours every day, um, with people. I mean, literally across the entirety of kind of the weird community. So not even just ghost hunters, but Bigfoot hunters and demonologists and I mean, <laughs> God bless. And, and what a what an amazing lineup y'all assembled so quickly. Uh, Calvin Von Krush, who, who also a new friend of mine, um, yeah. in, introduced, and this is the, the other funny thing, introduced to me via um, the very first guest we had on our show, Paul Nofsinger, who's another magician out of Greeley, Colorado, not too far from Estes and Loveland yeah. and everywhere else, awesome. um, who actually has, um, has, consulted with Aiden for the Stanley seance show. No uh, so yeah, small world everywhere around. Uh, but when he was on, he's friends with Calvin. Yeah. Um, he and Calvin and me and a couple other guys just sat down one night to have one of those uh, Zoom drinking meetings. You nice. know, we all just got together and drank whiskey and, and talked. Uh, and by the end of it, not only was I like, 
dude, Calvin Von Crush, you're this amazing person. I want to have you on my show. But he's even telling my buddy Paul, who's doing something uh, similar to this, you know, doing his own little webcasts. He said, you know, uh, I'm getting ready to do this convention uh, with, uh, I don't know if you guys know him, uh, Greg and Dana Newkirk. And I was like, the fuck you know Greg and Dana? Oh my God, hell yeah, blah, 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 blah. And then he told my buddy Paul, he goes, well, yeah, if you want to get him to interview, I can probably put in a good word. And, uh, and, and like two hours later, I'm whiskey drunk and I called my buddy and I said, hey, that was really awesome. We need to do this every week. By the way, if you book the new Kirks on your show before I do, I will murder you. Uh, and that was that. Was that. So, um, but but I, I do think that, you know, we, we've gotten to find like our tribe, our people yeah, sort of as a sure. result and, and not through, I think, any particular extra effort on our own. It's one oh. of these nice little ancillary benefits of the way the virus um, kind of put us all together. Uh, but that brought me to the convention, which then brought me to the museum and, and its Patreon. And so um, I want to talk about the real briefly. So I knew about the museum, uh, the, the full name Traveling Museum of the Paranormal and the Occult. Um, I mean, at least a few Michigan Paracons ago, yeah. right? And, yeah. um, and I know y'all have brought it to Amy's Strange Escapes events a few times mm -hmm. and you've been able to show yep. up with her. Uh, but when did it really, when, when was the origin? What's the origin story of the museum? Other than you being hit in the back of the head with a piece of coal. It, honestly, I know that story, I mean, right, but I mean... It started kind of by accident. Mm -hmm. We were invited to speak at an event, um, and they gave us a table, and we didn't have anything to sell, so we thought... We were there, funny story. Yeah, we, we were there for one of the only two times before Hellier 2 that we ever showed the abduction footage in yeah, public. Dude. And we oh, were giving a lecture right that was titled, How to Get Abducted by Aliens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the two times we showed it, but people were so disturbed by it. They hated it. Um, we, did, we, did, we, we actually showed it once disturbed. there and we showed it once at a strange escape with Amy. Yeah. And, and Amy, Amy said, came up to us later and she goes, don't ever show she, that. She was like, it's again. too scary. It's too scary. She's like, it just it, it it's freaks scary. people out too You're much. talking about that, uh, the, the hypnotic regression. The hypnotic yeah. regression. That yeah. is maybe one of the scariest parts of all oh, your Japan so down. Scary. It's terrifying. It's really so we were giving lectures on on that or we tried to we mm -hmm. gave two and um i thought they were great i thought they had the effect they should have had which is like yeah you should be scared it's when you're being told you're too scary at a paranormal conference you're yeah. doing it right i mean like that's exactly. right but anyway to dana's point we didn't have anything to promote like we were we didn't have anything to sell we didn't have a we have books or anything mm -hmm. and we didn't we're certainly not sign headshots and so we were like, what do we do? We've got this table. We don't want to just, I mean, it was a table at a big event. We didn't know what to do. And we just kind of were like, well, you know, we've got all of this stuff that we've collected that people don't ever get a chance to actually touch. Like that was the big deal. Mm -hmm. Like here's an allegedly haunted object, pick it up, touch it, test it. Yeah, That's right. what it's there for. Play with it. And mm -hmm. so it was like half a dozen things. Um, and we just put them on a table with a little handwritten sign. And we, could not keep up because so many people were like, wow, I mean, you're actually going to let me touch this. Mm -hmm. You're actually going to let me like, there were people there with their meters and stuff. We're like, yeah, that's the point. We yeah, want to. It's a huge thing. Yeah. And um, we realized after that, wow, there's really something to this. And we took it a little more seriously. And, you know, a few years later, what we started doing it in what, 2015? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and now, you know, five years later, it's I mean, know, we've got a post office box that yeah. just is filled with stuff every time we check it. And People come to events with things and, and donate things constantly. And I mean, uh, we've had a lot of, at this point in time, it's uh, a lot of people and our, so I think we agree with it, is that the museum is kind of just building itself. Yeah. It's, it's really, whatever is... Uh, being drawn to us is coming because it's uh, supposed to be with us and there's some sort of you know there's some reason for it so we just sort of go with it and I mean for uh, for us that inevitably we sort of take a bit of a different role when it comes to objects and we look at the objects as uh, really being the first thing that we focus on because we do have a lot of people who donate things anonymously and sometimes we have people who you know they want to work with us uh, but we're really looking for some kind of conflict resolution when it comes to objects, because more often than not, you know, 
what we're seeing is uh, an object that has a lot of trauma associated with it. Sure. So we're tr- we try to talk often about the ethics of caring for haunted objects and and kind of unpacking that because I think it's very popular right now to talk about haunted objects and to say, I have, I have haunted objects and look at, you know, I keep them in a ring of salt and I do all this. I have to protect myself from it. And there's zero conflict resolution. Like people don't really want to research or look into why the object is behaving that way in the first place. So our stance is really strongly in, in, you know, the ethics of what's caring for and curating uh, an object with a, some sort of a conscious intelligence attached to it. What does that look like? You know, how do we do that ethically? How yeah, do we if understand you think it? that there's, if you truly do believe there's some sort of an intelligence, some discarnate intelligence yeah. that for some reason is attracted to this object, what sort of a responsibility do you have to treat it as such? Yeah. Right, right. And there's to treat there's it as very little, few people, I think, that it, which can be incredibly frustrating, but you know, again, the bottom line is if there is something that's intelligent that is, ta- is attached to an object, if it's in your possession, you have a responsibility at that point to either do some conflict resolution or find a way for it to be comfortable because we're talking about it's no different than uh, a haunted uh, location having a re- you know a ghost that that spends time there. If we can look at those uh, instances and want to uh, care for the spirits that are still in places and take care of them and make sure that they're okay and make sure that they're they're working through their own trauma, we should be doing the same thing for objects and not exploiting them and being silly mm-hmm. about it. And mm-hmm. and so we kind of harp a lot uh, on uh the ethics of ha- what it is to curate haunted objects and what it means and and then at the end of the day i mean the real goal is to try to come to some sort of a conclusion uh through research and experimentation with the objects that we have that are active so that we can give them some kind of a resolution so they aren't just stuck here yeah. and, and confused and, I mean, and, and, and sometimes the resolution is just as simple as you know, 95% of the stuff that people send to us yeah. is just something that they have attached some sort of a trauma to. Yeah. So they have a bad experience and, with something. Right. And it's like this item, for some reason, whatever reason they've chosen, is the manifestation of this trauma. And then by giving it to us and us saying, don't worry, we'll take care of it for you, um, they're able to put that trauma out of their mind. Yeah, and it doesn't it. exist. Mm-hmm. And sure, maybe we've got a shelf full of tchotchkes that don't really do anything or maybe aren't really haunted the same way, but, but they're it's... really cool tchotchkes right i mean like right, that's <laughs> well, right. no, not <laughs> usually most of, right? most of them are like porcelain clowns yeah. oh they, i got one of those around there somewhere right? from hot topic <laughs> See, I'm, I'm thinking like the inkisi and the the voodoo drums and stuff i'm like no that's yeah, no, cool no, man <laughs> everybody only like here's the thing People only see the really cool looking ones. Yeah, right. The porcelain clown stand have, home. like a really cool history. Yeah. yeah. There's a for, for every for every idol of nightmares, yeah, yeah. there's like there is a hundred porcelain clowns. Sure. Right, of course. <laughs> that never do anything. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Though I love and I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to this because again, one of the reasons I, I respect y'all as much as I do is this notion of how to how to maintain an ethical stance in a in a paranormal community. Uh, though before we dig into how great you are, I'm going to tease Greg. So as I understand it, let me see if I've got this right. Oh, no. You had a talk at a convention that was so scary that Amy <laughs> Bruni told you to can it. So you decided the alternative would be to hand people the dark mirror instead. Is that is that basically yeah. what you're up? <laughs> That's about it. I'm just constantly just trying to, to right? torment people. <laughs> <laughs> I can, imagine, can you imagine? See, here's the, oh, go the ahead. difference oh, is. Yeah. After that, after that, uh, how to get abducted by aliens lecture, and mm-hmm. people saw that footage, you could have heard a pin drop yeah, in that, that room. Yeah, was very awkward. And like, the, Amy's events are very like, they're super lighthearted, like, and, you know, people <laughs> are just like, fun. they're just right. fun, and, and they're, they're, uh, they're not scary. Yeah. And so people saw that, and there were people who were like, mad where they're like did this hypnotist lose his license like they this? were like and we had to be like no, no you don't understand we're all on the same page like this is this dude got like, signed a consent form yeah it was all good right yeah, i can imagine like, that that silence and then i just want you to be like the mic um i guess i'll take some questions from the audience <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, question. no questions no after questions that. No. Yeah. no uh no so so that that aside um and i will say it's it's very interesting i the, the only time I've ever arched an eyebrow 
at anything. I mean, Tyler can run off into the woods and shoot flare guns and, and anything else. Um, but that, that hypnotic regression, you know, I'm like, even with that, you know, even Alan got a little miffed, you know, it's like, Oh, I don't, I don't mm -hmm. approve it. You know I mean? That was, but, but that's one of the things I like is that again, you made sure that everyone had informed consent. Oh yeah. And yeah. then like, you pushed the envelope. We didn't like try and trick our friends. Right, exactly. Um, and, and we I all think, knew. It could have been any one of us. Yeah. And that was always the argument. Yeah. And, and yeah. I think we need that. We need people to be able to, to push the envelope. Sure, um, yeah. But but be able to do that ethically. The, 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 yes. the map is not the territory. Yeah. And we're always talking about mm -hmm. how you know, if you're just trying to replicate what you've seen on TV or what you've read in books, like you're only you're only going to get to the same place other people have gone. Mm -hmm. And if the whole point is to try and learn new things, you need to take the maps that other people have made for us, follow them, and then go beyond their boundary. Like mm -hmm. that's the point. Mm -hmm. And that's you know you can't you can't do that easily if you are too reserved, which is part of the reason why we're uh, constantly talking about. You know, our motto is curiosity through fear, curiosity over right. fear. Right. And we're always, I mean, you know, again, we're, we're careful and we're, we're, uh, we would never do anything kind of, uh, dangerously, but, but it, there is, again, the curiosity over fear is what led us to the conclusions, you know, that we came to with Billy, our, our key seat figure. Mm -hmm. And we had, we not pushed through the initial fear and, and really dug into research and, and worked with Billy, we would probably not have come to the same conclusions and uh, his story probably would have been a very different one. So there, mm -hmm. we try, we always try to do that in a safe way, but in a way that, you know, inevitably yeah, with everything we with, do. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, and again, and I, Greg and I were talking about this before we started the, the show, but um, I, I think it, it needs mentioning um, I, any, anybody would be remiss if they don't point out uh, y'all sort of commitment to these um ethical issues not just in a, in a paranormal sense but the ethical issues of the day while at the same time presenting that in the paranormal community so for instance mm. um i'm lucky enough to to have joined the museum's patreon at a fairly high tier uh, mm -hmm. which means i have pretty well access to to kind of everything that's offered in the rewards and one of those is that i now have access to dana's uh, magic of the month which we've alluded to so as, yes. a, as a practicing hedge witch um you're doing this great thing on Patreon where, where every month, uh, not only are you doing classes uh, like this, where you're, you're doing like sort of live events uh, where people can kind of follow along and, and you talk about different topics as relates to magic. Uh, but every month you also send out a, a sort of, how do you, how do you put it? Uh, all necessary materials included. Spell yes. kit, right. I kind of, I describe it as a, uh... When I so when I first started to become interested in magic a million years ago, I initially had a really tough time finding um, finding teachers that I felt comfortable with and that I felt uh, were sort of open enough to to facilitate learning and uh, experimenting, but then also to kind of let, let people be uh, their own uh, witches and their own magic practitioners so that you could go out and seek your own pathways. And so when we first started really thinking about what Magic of the Month would be, I really wanted it to be a monthly, I wanted it to be a themed monthly ritual that, that would, uh, you know, you, I handcraft every aspect of that ritual for you. So it's, sometimes it's candles, sometimes it's oils, um, sometimes it's incense, and it's usually all of the above. And then I hand, uh, you know, I sit and uh, I create a ritual that uh, I kind of guide you through. And then I just give you everything you need and you go and do it yourself. Yeah, and but it's not, I mean, I would even say you're, you're almost underselling that a little bit because when you say I give you every, <laughs> kind of everything you need to do it, yeah, the last <laughs> month we got like three full typewritten pages of instructions, oh, yeah, you know, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a whole, and so it's not even like light this candle in this way and say these things and da da da. You get into, look, here's the theory behind it. This is why yeah. we're doing this. These are the sympathetic uh, sort of connections we're setting up and, and things like that. So this last one, what had um, one of my favorite stones of all time, Moldavite, which was in, mm -hmm. it's, it's literally my piece is sitting back behind me on this altar. I love it. Um, yeah. Uh, in my little medicine bag and, and everything else, uh, back when I was a, you know, 14 year old ghost hunter. 
Um, <laughs> but but Moldavite in essential oil and a tea and a couple candles and and, and mm -hmm. so I mean it is a full blown ritual. I mean yeah, everything. it's a whole thing. Right. It's uh yeah, and I mean I I try to. I, every time I sit down to write Magic of the Month, I won't, I write it as if it's me having a conversation with you. Mm -hmm. So it's me guiding and facilitating your uh, magical experience. And everything is handmade and uh, all of the aspects of each part of it is curated so that I'm buying things ethically and I'm being careful about what we're buying and who we're buying mm -hmm. from. Because I'm, you know, when, when, people who practice magic and who like to buy magic magical and witchy things sometimes you get stuff and it just feels gross the intention behind it feels gross and you can cleanse it but that intention is still really like That's embedded it. in it I, I live and work in the french quarter you don't have to tell me I was right say, yeah, there's yeah, a yeah, lot of that in this neighborhood orleans, you know exactly what i'm but and the thing is new orleans has so much so many amazing places too mm -hmm. that you 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 can feel the difference between somebody who's put their blood sweat and tears or love and their uh, all of the intentions into something and then somebody who just bought some bulk stuff well, you know uh, alibaba. alibaba yeah and you can feel the difference and so them. my goal is to always make sure that it is uh it, it feels that way you can feel it um and yeah i like it to feel like a conversation between me and you and so um if i'm really just facilitating kind of again that sense of re-enchantment that's the best thing that I could possibly be doing with each one of the magic of the month. But even there, I think, uh, so I was at your, your class a couple days ago, two days ago, uh, two days ago, two days yeah. ago right. Uh, time is irrelevant these days. It doesn't uh, right. exist anymore. Yeah, exactly. Um, but you know, we, we kind of got off onto a tangent about the whole, uh, sort of UFO, uh, hybrid star seed, indigo star children, seeds. all that, all that sort of genre. And, and one of the things that's always turned me off about the star seed sort of community is the same thing you mentioned is that yeah. it can get a little racist really fast. Oh yeah, uh, and, absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I have, I have lots of, I don't have lots. I have a few friends who I truly do believe, you know, if, if I do believe in star seeded people, they are, people who I, I could absolutely 100% buy, but uh, kind of traverse big eyes and giant, giant no. heads. <laughs> one, Tiny of, one of them is actually a friend of mine who is a, she's a, a woman of color. And, and so for her, and, and she is one of the most ethereal, magical people. And so when you kind of spend time in those spaces, specifically the starseed spaces, you often come up against people who tell you, well, traditionally starseeds have blue eyes and blonde hair and they're tall and thin and mm -hmm. white, or they have this certain kind of blood type. And really the bottom line is, and if I can, you know, I, I, I talked about it in class, it's but eugenics, it's, right? it's kind of coded racism yeah, and it I mean, really is. And it exists in that space. So you have to kind of call people out when you see that. Well, even like, space. I love every story I've ever heard about the Nordics, you know, yes, about the, the Nordic Nordics. aliens. You mean just Swedish people? They're hilarious. <laughs> I mean, but, but like every time you get a really good one, it is about like, the Pleiadian tall blonde Nordic that dressed in a nun's habit and went to Vegas, you know, like, and you're like, what, oh, what yeah. is this story yeah. even about? I mean, you even start looking at some of the stories of the Venusians and stuff, yeah. and people who went to, to Venus, well, they had, a, again, these were stories from the mm -hmm. 50s, mostly. Right. The, the guys who went to the spaceship and went with the beautiful blonde Venusians <laughs> to Venus, well, they segregated their... Uh, Right. other other and races as well you read and these, it's funny how they're all christians yeah, too right? always, that's, and and i get it because you're absolutely right these are coming from the 50s or even earlier it's going to keep the cultural impressions of the times absolutely um, but but what boggles me is that nobody ever talks about it right yeah like, like they just like, we just read all this stuff about these tall blonde blue-eyed aliens <laughs> and nobody mentions <laughs> like it, is this a little Nazi to anybody else? Is it oh, just yeah. me? I mean, you're, right. you're, 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 you even start to look at some of the ancient astronaut theories. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's what they're basically saying with a lot of them is um, uh, African American or African people wouldn't have been able to be this smart. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know what I mean? Like, like people right. from Egypt yeah, couldn't have possibly, couldn't have built brown people couldn't have built these pyramids. It's so right. unbelievable. Now, I will say, I've never been to the pyramids in Egypt, uh, but I was lucky enough to, I took three weeks in India. And got to see yeah. some of the Jain temples where the carvings oh are just, God. I mean, it's the whole amazing. temple. And I will say, when I stood in that temple and looked around, my impression was not, there's no way the Indian people could have made it. My impression was, I don't understand how human beings yeah. made this at all. And so I, I felt myself having the same thought 
that that I didn't feel like had that sort of racist component. Um, yeah. It's just unfortunate that so many of the good monuments are in places that are in countries of color, yeah. India, sure. Africa, yeah. etc. cetera. Uh, we just don't have the same ancient structures visible in America that we can point at though. You know, again, if you go to my neck of the woods, I've, I've hung out at the old Natchez mounds and things like that. And you can sure. say the same thing there. Like, really? They just figured this all out on their own <laughs> with no... Well, I mean, we have that, like yeah. here, you know, you have the Serpent Mound in Ohio. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. Same type of thing. We've got that type of stuff all over. And this is, you know, there's a lot of stuff. One of the big books that we uh, referred to in, in season two of Hellier a lot is The Rebirth of Pan. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of that stuff that's yes, not indeed. so subtle in it. Right. Yeah where it's very much like there's no way that these backward civilizations could have built this stuff. Yeah. And I, I think that's the wrong way of looking at it. Um, and I think that a lot of that is, is trying to take some power away sure. from that culture. Yeah. Well, and I think so many of us just, we, we just avert our eyes from it. You know, mm -hmm. you just sort yeah. of don't talk about that particular aspect of it. Um, and yet you guys, you know, my experience is you, you're not afraid to look head on and, and address it. And so that's what, what happened in the Starseed lecture. Uh, we saw it again just recently in the museum forums about uh, ethical gathering of white sage and Palo Santo yeah, and all of these exactly. different materials. Yeah, we did. I mean, you know, it's funny too, because we, I, I stopped using sage in Magic of the Month and we did, I did, I, hilariously enough, it was about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago when Paulo really started to become very popular in the mm -hmm. new age community. And uh, people had no idea about the, the ceremonial aspects to Palo Santo and also how it's gathered and why it's gathered and why it's, it was used and what culture it, it's basically being appropriated from. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I did I did Apollo, uh, I had Apollo in uh, one of our Magic of the Month goodie bags and we talked a lot about cultural appropriation in the New Age community and uh, why it is so... I mean, it, for years, it's been allowed to kind of be just run itself out of, you know, madness, like it's been so bad, but it's really nice now that there are uh, a lot of that stuff is starting to be called out and mm -hmm. in a loving way, you know, and in a way that um, it has hopefully that stuff's not even being used accurately but that's exactly it i mean you're, you're not even the way using it ceremonially right. you're yeah. just burning it and throwing it around your crystals that's not really you know what i mean it smells right. great sure but there's a there's a ceremony to it and maybe you know you shouldn't be the person doing that ceremony mm -hmm. or maybe you should find a person to help you learn the ceremony properly so or at least if you're going to do it actually understand understand it, it. at least understand. have an appreciation mm -hmm. and a, yeah, yeah exactly have a appreciation and knowledge of yeah. why it's used but that was a great used. post that that um yeah people were, were talking about mm -hmm. the importance of understanding that and it's it, you don't see it as often as i think you, you really need to mm -hmm. and then the last thing i want to bring up um you know we had a conversation come up in the museum forums not too long ago um basically about mental illness in the context of the paranormal community yeah um and and Greg, you, you were you were kind of so impassioned about this that you, you jumped on a Facebook Live like this and, and gave basically just a 20 minute off the cuff speech on, look, this is how we need to address it. This yeah. is how this community will address it since it's, it's you know, my community is the leader, etc. This is what we think is ethical. And, and what I loved about it is you said, um, and, and forgive me if I'm paraphrasing here, but, but you basically said, look, if if you present to us as the investigators a paranormal occurrence that we think is putting you in danger, right? Or that perhaps is indicative of uh, some sort of mental illness or some sort of mental health issue. Uh, the first thing that not even we need to do as investigators, the first thing you need to do as the experiencer is to go kind of get yourself checked out, talk to a yeah. shrink, talk to yeah. a doctor, make sure. And, and I understood it was, it, it was kind of, I'll say bemusing on, on a viewership to watch you grappling with the 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 apprehension that must come with making that kind of bold public statement to a thousand people right i mean it was definitely there but but you kind of stood your ground and you said it's not that we don't believe you and i think that was that was what no one ever says on that side of things you know it's almost yeah. like you have to either totally believe in alien abductions and ghosts and everything right. supernatural yeah. and you never talk about mental health yeah. or everything is a mental illness and ghosts and aliens and everything else doesn't exist. Sure. Mm -hmm. and, and to find that middle road where you say, look, it's not that we don't believe you. 
It's just that these are the steps that need to happen in order for you to protect your health. Um, yeah. And I thought that was a great, uh, a great sentiment. Uh, and as I was discussing it with my wife, I, I pointed out, you know, from the perspective of a ghost hunter, I said, it's just common sense. Yeah. If, if I'm oh, investigating yeah. a room and my EMF meter is going off like crazy, yeah, maybe that's ghosts, but maybe you should also check your electrical box just to make sure your house is not about sure. to burn down, right? Sure. And, and, and you, mean would, you would have no issue, no one, not, not the, not the, the homeowner, not the viewers, nobody would have any issue with a paranormal investigator saying, hey, we're getting huge EMF readings, so let's check the electrical signals, and then mm -hmm. if there's nothing there, let's talk about ghosts. But mm -hmm. as soon as you say, hey, you're hearing disembodied voices, let's right. talk about disassociative identity disorder, and then once we've checked that diagnosis, let's talk about ghosts. Yeah. Um, and that's I mean, because so... there's not, I mean, and this is, I think, again, I feel like everything we do is an uphill battle because people assume everything is exactly like they've seen it on TV, on TV. Or movies mm -hmm. or whatever. And, you know, if I'm hearing, if I'm already invested in, in the, the spooky community and I start to hear voices or I feel a presence and it's telling me to harm myself, that must mean that I have a malicious spirit, you can call it <laughs> demon, whatever. Right. And like, sure, here's the thing. I'm, of anybody you'll meet, I'm open to every possibility. Mm -hmm. I absolutely am open to every possibility. But I also know that I don't want to be the person who goes, you're right, you need an exorcism or you need a crystal or a bundle of sage. And then you end up, do, you end up actually harming yourself mm -hmm. because it turns out, yeah, yourself or someone else, it turns out you actually have disassociative yeah. identity disorder or, or any number of actual illnesses uh, that weren't treated because I was uh, too excited mm -hmm. at the possibility that I was going to get to talk to a demon right. in that exorcism or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And then I'm implicated. Mm -hmm. and, well, and there's and too many people who are too excited to jump to those conclusions without getting people actual help. Yeah. Right. And I think well, the important point too is, is like you, you both have mentioned actually is making sure that that person understands that it's not a matter of not believing that what you're experiencing is, is potentially paranormal. It's just ruling out the other possible option. Right. Well, which and and especially when those possible options, could be potentially dangerous to yes, the, yes, the person. Exactly. And I think yeah. that's what I wanted to jump on just then when you, when you say, Greg, what, what you said there was, um, you know, and I'll overlook that because I'm excited about getting to talk to this demon or this spirit. Yeah. And, and yeah. boy, there's the difference, right? It's a, a, a focus on me as the investigator and what cool paranormal experience I get to have. Yeah. Versus what the real function I think of paranormal investigation ought to be, which is to help the afflicted, you know, and, sure. and honestly, and then we can get into whether or not the afflicted is the homeowner and or the ghost, right? Yeah, because sure. sometimes it's the ghost that needs help. Mm -hmm. um, but I also appreciate the fact that you guys aren't all love and light. Let's banish everything every time we go into a haunted house either, because <laughs> yeah. I've always thought that was ridiculous, right? So yeah. um, again, I know I'm echoing your own words, Greg, but you've been talking a lot lately about that, that middle road. Uh, but, but more and more, I think like that's, that's what's missing so often in our community is that we, and, and you say in the paranormal community or in the larger community, we've become sure. so polarized. So oh, absolutely. you're either with me or against me that there's no room for nuance. There's no room for looking at both sides of the story or considering all possibilities before you decide on a course How of are action. you supposed to shake hands with the other side of the room if you're right. so, far so far away? You That's just can't do it. Mm -hmm. And everything in this life is about uh, shaking hands. Everything is about, like, look at how much we crave that when we're not right. able to do that. Yeah. Right. There are people who cannot deal with it to the point where they will risk their lives so they can go and hug somebody. Uh, and, and, and yet people are divided over that even. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very difficult to, to get any kind of progress whatsoever without being able to walk that middle of the road. Uh, it's the best place to be because you don't have to like, here's the thing, man. I, 
I feel like I'm failing as a human being if I believe the same stuff that I believed five years ago. Sure. Yeah. I yeah. don't feel like I'm getting anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't think that we should think the same things we thought it's, you know, we were talking about, you know, uh, this last week in the museum, we went through the master list of everything we've written right. since 2017 when we launched the membership program. Even going through some of those old things from 2017, I'm like, man, I really don't even agree with myself that's about crazy. the way that I saw this anymore. That's good. I mean, that, because that's I've changed right. so that's much. Mm -hmm. And we should, I, I really truly do think we should always be striving for that. We should always be striving to understand other people's ideas and, and have a middle of the road approach because it's the one that gives you the most. You know, I'm, I, I really, a, a person that I really like who wrote a, a great book about chaos magic, the chaos protocols, Gordon White, mm -hmm. he talks about this idea of stored optionality and that's true magic is stored sure. optionality. Mm -hmm. And where do you get more stored optionality than being in the middle of the road? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Right. And, and that really is it. The ability to change your mind. That's mm -hmm. magic. Mm -hmm. The ability the, to change your mind and I, to do it with dignity. I will say this. Uh, one one hell your lover to another. You know who I don't think hangs out on that middle road? Tyler Strand. Pan. 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 I don't think Pan hangs middle out road. on the middle road. He's he's yeah. way out there on the edge somewhere. So oh yeah, right. uh, for sure. For I sure. I definitely was not watching the last episode of season two yelling, get drunker. It won't work unless you're really drunk, <laughs> right? Uh, but, but you know, what no, can you do in front of uh, there's camera? There's a lot of there's yeah, there's a lot of people who thought we should have had an orgy in that cave. Yeah, and or, <laughs> here's the thing: lots of hallucinogens. Here's the thing: a lot too. The pants just being gentle with us. I think so, <laughs> and I hope so. I if that's the case. <laughs> um, I. You look at a lot of old school. So we talk a lot about uh, Thelema, right? We uh -huh. talk a lot about um, high magic. A lot of it involves uh, sticking a lot of things in orifices. <laughs> a and lot there's a lot of, a lot of things that some would say are pretty outdated. And one of the things that I think Hellier is, is a new ritual. Yeah. We were talking about a um, new ritual for a new time. We were talking about Austin Osmond spare uh, last yeah. week and all his rituals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Though I will say, in the sense that I know you send Tyler out to the woods when everybody else fears to go out there by themselves. Um, mm -hmm. When it gets to the point where you need volunteers to be torn apart by the man ads for, you know, Hell Your Season 7, hit me up. I'm here in New Orleans. That's, you got uh, it. Yeah, I'm, you I'm got okay. It. As, an, <laughs> as an ecstatic, personally, I'm okay with those Dionysian, you know, ego annihilation moments. Uh, right. But good, good. Uh, if somebody good to needs know. to be, right? Um, so... Look, we're, we're already like 15 minutes uh, over time. Um, so I want to make sure I can get to, to the questions that we've got here. Uh, before yeah. I do that, let me ask you this. I, I can see kind of scrolling through our comments. Uh, we've linked the Patreon uh, to the museum. Uh, so guys, at, at the very minimum, five bucks a month. And, and speaking as one of the members, I can't tell you how much content you're getting for that. Um, we try. We try. Do the 15 a month for as long as y'all are still doing para-quarantine and, just, oh, yeah. um, and these, just, these yeah. virtual conventions. The membership will just keep going forever. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and then, like I said, if, if, if you've got it and you can do the magic of the month, I think it's, it's just the coolest thing I've seen on that witch uh, metaphysical side for a long time. Um, so, so look into all that. That link is there. Uh, the link, we, we linked the story about the dark mirror. Um, nice. Yeah, just just a whole bunch of different things. Um, but I want to ask you, outside of that, uh, Greg, I promised I would put you on the spot at least once. Let's go. So, um, are you willing, in front of our audience of about two dozen people, uh, <laughs> will you commit now, officially on this show? Oh God! To a hellier season three. <laughs> it's like asking you if you'll run for president, right? Like, will I you mean, announce it? Here's, here's the thing that every what inevitably happens specifically with hell year two we all quit at separate points during mm -hmm. it because oh, you it, see so that's, not, that's right. not a lie no mm -hmm. it's either it was either too intense or too scary or we were like this is not what i wanted to do or it, for whatever reason mm -hmm. but it it continues to pull us back in and like clockwork the second that uh the second season um 
was released into the world that week we had like oh it's two days later no it was the day the, the next day after it went live actually we had, like, I, i'm gonna massive. i'm gonna correct both of you because it's in my notes uh you told oh. ben and aaron it was five hours after season five, that's one right. dropped. Yeah. five hours because it came up it came up at it was it didn't go live oh, at midnight God. like we wanted it that's to right. it didn't go live until i think like four or five in the morning yeah because we got the time difference and, and, and it was such a like a bummer launch because we were like we were, like, uh, we were all on on skype together oh. we all, had drinks <laughs> all right we were like, live. why isn't it going live and so after a couple hours we we're just like oh, i'm going to, I'm bed, gonna go to bed now. and then we woke up and it was live like, and i already live. had a message in my inbox yeah. from somebody it was um and, related uh, very closely to the case and it has sent us since then well that's that was going to be my other my other sort of if i'm going to swing for the fences i might as well a get a a verbal commitment for season three that it's, doesn't look like that's going to happen yeah, um, it's just, yeah it's going to happen it's going to happen all right there we go just, i think it's a matter of when not yeah. if i'm gonna stop you right there greg you just officially said on this program yeah, yes happen. hell your season three will be happening um, i i think that i don't think that the phenomena is quite done with us yet. It's good. I, I know it's not because of the amount of insane things that have happened yeah. since it came out. But when you know, and it's one of those things where with Hallier, I think that the we have always been the the five of us have always been very honest about the idea that some seasons might happen really fast because if it's happening really fast, it happens, but we're never going to force anything. We're always going to allow it to come naturally and the, the have the progression of it be very organic and natural and cool. authentic because that authenticity I think is what makes Hellier what it is. So I, say, we I don't think... know when it will be right. COVID also isn't helping that. Sure. But, um, uh, I, I think that I don't think there's any way. Around. I think it's at a, least yeah, doing it's a, it's, a, it's a near impossibility. It's not going to happen. Okay. Somewhere. So what, what you're world. saying is, what I should really do is next season get Pan on the show. Yes. And ask yeah. Pan, will there be that. a Hellier season three? Let's, no. Um, perfect. Well, well and maybe so, what we can do is get Carl or Tyler back on the the Frank Spot. Get him back on the Frank Spot. See, we'll see, yeah, so. see, he jumps in. I feel like that would be terrifying. I feel like Tyler's already way too horny as it is. <laughs> it's I don't really, want to be around yeah. him. Handle's well, probably like without without digging too much into it, because again, I think we could talk for another hour on this subject. But I I do kind of feel as if uh, when you watch season two, there are, and I don't want to set them up in opposition, right? But there are at least two factions that have their fingers in this big phenomena pie, right? And I mean, ultimately, mm. there's probably, you know, 300 factions, but sure. mm -hmm. but, but there's at least kind of two um, that I don't think, you know, maybe they're in opposition, but at the very least, they don't have the same goals in mm. mind, mm -hmm. right? That they're, they're sort of lines the same way. And I do think that in season two, um, the team comes into contact with both both sides as it is, mm. right? I can believe that. Um, so, sure. so both your sort of, uh, uh, you know, green contingent and the gray contingent and, and mm. we'll kind of leave it at that, right? Uh, sure. Yeah, I, I about to say, everybody <laughs> still watching can easily read through the lines on that one. So, yeah. um, but but it is, it's, it's really interesting to see that kind of play out in real time. And, and absolutely the fact that you let the phenomena drive for the most part, yeah. uh, I think really does. That, that's, that's why it's so compelling. Um, so, so that was one. All right. So we have a, a firm, maybe from uh, from Greg about season three. But that was <laughs> that's the other all thing. I'll commit to is so, a, is it's. I think like again. Yeah. It's a matter of when. Not right. a, yeah. That's so the, the other question <laughs> I want to ask is the one you alluded to. So, so in an interview uh, five months back, you you mentioned that you said you were asked the same question, right? Will there be a season three? And and yeah. you said it's you know it's really interesting. Right as season one dropped, we got this email. That, that is crazy and has sent us in a totally different direction, et cetera. My understanding, I, I know better than to think I'm going to let you get you to spill any of those uh, secrets or information here. I just want to make sure you're not, that's not the Amy email you're talking about there. No, actually, it's funny. It's not even, wasn't even an email, it was a text. Oh, that's okay. Right. It's a person that I know that well mm -hmm. that texted me uh, this insane information that's just, been lingering in the background this whole time. It just needed the right it circumstance. Just, and it was to... one of those things where uh, Dana is very, very uh, right when she says in at the end of season two, I think we'll go back to every place that we've been. And I think there's a lot of things that are left 
that were left undone that we still need to do. And I think every time we do something correctly, and I think there's a lot of things that we've done incorrectly or maybe got close to, but every time we do something correctly, it's like a new, it's like playing a video game. It's just a new path opens yeah, up. It. Sure. And yeah. then you've got a whole new world to explore. And I think uh, that's sort of where we're in right now. Yeah. I mean, and it's so much to the idea of like the walking the labyrinth, right? You have to find your way back out too. Yeah. And I think that's part of that process. Mm -hmm. That's really, I, I don't, I, I have no idea if that's what will happen, but there's part of me that thinks that, that it feels organic that it would be part of the process, I think. So. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, before, I, I, before yeah, we go, that, do, do y'all have time to take a, a couple questions? We've got a few. Of course, here in the yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All right, let's go all the way back up because there were some few. Oh my lord! More more comments than I thought we had. Um, all right, uh, meditation sound bath. So there's one I just saw um, from my dear friend that I mentioned uh, who was asking me about the spirit boxes. Uh, Emily out in Vegas says, uh, "At what point would you be uncomfortable?" Uh, sort of pursuing a lead or continuing an investigation. Has there ever been one you pulled so, the ripcord on and said, I'm out, I can't do this? So I, I think obviously like that's case by case basis, mm -hmm. but one of our rules is like, we don't ever want what we're doing to hurt anybody else. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And so like, there are a lot of times where I feel like us getting involved would only make things more complicated or make things more, um, I would just cause more harm Ch than good. Like a little bit more, more chaos. More make more chaos than sure. good. And so I'm not typically like, I, I do worry a lot about our own safety. I worry about my friend's safety and things like that. But I mean, as you can see, like we're willing to push the boundaries a little bit with ourselves, mm -hmm. but you I don't ever want to do something that would inadvertently hurt somebody else. That's like, a good answer. We mm -hmm. even have... I mean, you should see the types of arguments that we have before each season of Hellier comes out when it's about like, okay, what sort of information do yeah. we give? How much um, do you disclose? How right. much do we yeah. show this? Because we don't want like and we also, undue stress on a community that yes. doesn't want attention, well, that type of thing, or people. I mean, I know you've had problems with that. I know there have, oh, been, yeah. there have been random <laughs> groups showing up in Hellier in Somerset, Kentucky, trying to just pick up where y'all left off, which yeah. is yeah. just well, insane. Bothering you know, people, I mean, calling like, people. We have a lot of, of conversations um, as we're going through the final stages of, ed as Carl's going through the final stages of editing, where we really argue a lot about pieces <laughs> of information that could lead people to to either people or locations that are private, that are people who don't want to necessarily be involved. We don't ever want to put anyone in a position where they, they, they're in kind of in, sort of Feeling forced to be a part of or, invasive. Yeah. There's also a whole element in season two, which, you know, there's, there's a lot of the elements in it about like satanic cults. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we were very, very careful about is like, we didn't want to start a satanic panic because says, yeah. that's, that's not what this is about. Yeah. And we, we understand, you know, as people that are in this community as magic practitioners, that ruins lives. Yeah. Like there are people who've gone to jail and had their lives ruined just yeah. because someone said, you know, that person's in a cult. And they like worship Damian the devil. Eccles. Right? Especially Damian Eccles, literally. West Memphis three. Yeah. In, in, in rural Midwestern towns too. Yeah. yeah. For y'all to swoop in as this group and go, hey, we're here to investigate the satanic cult in town. And then come exactly. up, and then come up empty handed and be like, well, never mind. I guess we're out of here. Well, that <laughs> yeah, idea stays that. in that community and, and I, forever. I think, right. In, there's fortunately most people understand yeah. what's, what we're doing in Hellier, particularly mm -hmm. season two, but there's that subset of people that are very into like the in lizard people or killing babies for their adrenochrome. Mm -hmm. Well, they want to see stuff. it again. We talked about this. They want to see the blockbuster version of Hellier. Yeah. So, yeah. And the so problem if it is, doesn't end with, with you guys in a cave somewhere facing off against Cthulhu with your magic and flare guns, you know, right. like they're yeah. not going to be That's satisfied. That's not real life. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Some would argue that even the boring stuff we're doing is not real life. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> so but the thing, mm -hmm. the thing is, 
you know, there's so much more to those conversations yeah. and those stories yeah. and those legends that mm-hmm. did not make it into season two no because we knew while they might just be local folklore, mm-hmm. every town has their local folklore. Like all the teenage kids think the Masons aren't just a bunch yep. of bored old men doing nice things for the community. They think they're all oh, they're worshiping the devil or whatever they're doing in their secret cult. We knew if we went and included too much of that, people would latch onto it and they would take it too seriously. And mm-hmm. even the little that we did leave in, some people took it too yeah. seriously. Yeah. Yeah. So like, I never, I never once thought that there are actually people in the caverns under Somerset, Kentucky, sacrificing people to some God. I never actually thought that was the case. What I thought was, oh, there's a history of unsolved murders in this town. Right. There's actual like uh, uh, people who've been assassinated. Probably has more to do with the drug trade and the sex trade mm-hmm. than some satanic cult. Right. Um, but that's what I mean when I say like we we are the things that we look into sometimes uh, us we could cause more harm. Yeah. If we mm-hmm. think we're going to cause more harm than good, we won't do it. Mm-hmm. We think we're going to hurt somebody that uh, either accidentally or, I mean, sometimes it just, if we're going to send a bunch of people as people's property or like yeah. invade their privacy right. Right. or on a smaller like scale that. level, if we're going to go do a home investigation for yeah. someone who probably clearly has a mental issue, mm-hmm. we don't want to do that because we don't want to go. We don't want to even give them the idea that there's a demon in their right. house that's going to drive them crazy or, or give them a, a reason to, to kneel into their Focusing mental illness. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's those types of things that we typically would say no yeah, to. That's mm-hmm. a good answer. There you go. Uh, more comments. I told you we had some, some hell your initiates in here. Um, Kia says she, she just came across a passage in Yates uh, in his uh, a vision where he talks about musical tones, uh, mm-hmm. just FYI. And of course, Yates way into the fairy tales and yeah, I've got a bunch sure. of Yates stuff behind me. <laughs> All right. He's one of my guys. Um, I'm going to pose this one to you as a uh, question, Dana, even though it really wasn't. Uh, true or false? Mm. Reenchantment ties directly back to Tolkien's ideas about how fairy stories help to reenchant things we take for granted as prosaic and normal, like bread, trees, the sky, etc. Agree or disagree? I would definitely agree with that. <laughs> that's my that's my friend, the Tolkien scholar. <laughs> Absolutely agree with that. She, there is a comment earlier when I said that you two have the same level of knowledge. Uh, she simply commented, "Bold." Yeah, and I'm oh, like, yeah, it was true. a bold it's, thing it's to it's say. So, yeah, I love. How, I also love. Dana speaks how, Elvish. Not mm-hmm. very. Well, I, I, I need to put you on the spot or anything. So Don't, does uh, so does Christian. now, but but do <laughs> uh, but hold up, Greg. Any any Tolkien nerd would go now. Hold on, when you say Elvish, which dialect are we talking yeah, we'll about? Find Elvish. Yeah, <laughs> he's, he's not Tolkien. Could nerd. it be Cinderin? Could it be Quinya? Could it be right? Ah, see, <laughs> there's a lot of options oh, there. No. I only know <laughs> this because I am also adjacent to a Tolkien nerd. That is um, that's how this works. I uh, I try to as much as I can. Um, get Greg to watch the movies. At the oh, movie. I love the movies. I saw every one of them opening night. Yeah, but I theater. like I can literally watch them every day. And I'm like, Greg, just you know. Let's the problem is, I know if we put them on, Dana will be crying for a week. Yeah, I also have never uh, like when the when the films first came out, and uh, I we went. I saw them obviously on opening night. Of course, we um, and when. Uh, Return of the King was ending, there was a lady in the chair next to me who literally turned to me and said, oh my God, are you okay? Because I literally <laughs> bawling, I was right. sobbing so hard. Like, I think she thought I was having a seizure. I don't know. I was just out of control, ugly. Mm-hmm. The very first time Greg experienced me finishing the Lord of the Rings films, he looked a little bit traumatized. And I was just like, I was ugly crying, sobbing. And it's then I uh, it's, it's confronting like to come face to face with that kind of fandom i'm just saying um and here's the funny thing i've also uh, being paranormal events like we do a lot of paranormal events uh-huh. i have uh seen multiple hobbits in, at she events won't go near them. i can't because words won't come out of my mouth i always keep trying like come on I, just, just, I, come, I, just come meet him i saw sean austin and i was literally like she's starting to cry right? like, I couldn't, it was embarrassing i couldn't do it so no 
I can't do really? if I like uh, Carl and Connor have both investigated at the Stanley Hotel with Elijah Wood, and I was literally like, "You <laughs> investigated with Frodo. You don't even understand." And apparently, he's the nicest person on the planet. So, I, I believe, but it. I, I don't handle that stuff very well. <laughs> I, I love the image of a uh, of a. It's, no, it's it's not Elijah Wood. It's uh, it's Daniel Radcliffe. Daniel Radcliffe in the in the bathrobe with the handguns. Yeah, and it's like who knew this was going to be my coronavirus outfit? And yet, that's yes. that's pretty well exactly what exactly. it's like. Um, so we've got another question here. It says, um, "Have you ever had any experience with a spirit that you considered not human? Uh, and if so, what set it apart?" I think we have plenty. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think you know. We we talk a lot about Billy or the the you know we used to call him the idol of nightmares. Um, I don't think he was ever human. No. Um, and I think it's just, there's, I think a lot of what we deal with as ghost hunters are not human. Yeah. I yeah. think mm-hmm. a lot of it, but I, but I, the problem is in popular paranormal circles, when you say inhuman spirit, demon. they think you're talking about a demon, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. I don't right. think I that mean, that's even the elementals case. elementals are mm-hmm. now being kind of right. roped into the evil like, Which is just ridiculous. nonsense. It's mm-hmm. just like it's just insane. Um, you know, I, I think that there's a sliding scale. You know, black. I don't think black and white. Looking at things black and white doesn't do anything yeah. good for anybody. Yeah. Again, mm-hmm. it's that idea of the middle road. I think everything's a sliding scale. Um, I think it's 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 weird to say, but I think there's an intuitive. It, it's very feeling true. Yeah. That what you're dealing with is not a human intelligence or just like seems to operate differently or it feels like an alien feels presence very different. um and, and by that i don't necessarily mean like extraterrestrial just right. like it's Other, not otherworldly yeah otherworldly yeah. Yeah. yeah anytime also i feel like i can think of two instances off the top of my head where we we spent the night uh investigating the jenny wade house in gettysburg and then we also spent the night alone in the uh, lizzie borden house oh, wow. and i think more often than not really truly when when i think what we're coming up against is some is human or, or was a living person at one point it we deal we're talking about boatloads of trauma there's just so mm-hmm. so much trauma and it just feels like you can feel that same sensation. The familiarity. It's familiarity, exactly. The familiarity it's like, with human emotion. I'm just like, oh, you just don't have a body, but you're very much here. Like, you just don't have a physical body, but your personality still feels very present. And it comes out through EVP. I can, it feels, that's a really good way of putting it in wanna, the weirdest way, but it feels very familiar. Yeah. I don't want to say it's scary when you, or when you think you're in the presence of something that wasn't human, because I don't think scary is the right word. I think the word is unsettled. Yeah. yeah. It keeps you on your guard for, for, yes. for sure. It just like you, yeah, it just, you're, it doesn't feel relatable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's exactly it. It doesn't feel relatable. Can, it feels alien. It right. feels otherworldly. Mm-hmm. And you just sort of have that intuitive gut, gut sense check, that yeah. this is not, sometimes it feels like an animal mm-hmm. even when you're in the presence of right. an animal. Well, that's what I was about to say. You up. Yeah, exactly. Is it, is it like when you, when you deal with a wild animal and you're never quite sure, well, is yep. this one of those where I should make big arm gestures or not? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, exactly. right. Um, and it's, it's that sort of thing. I also, it's funny. There's a, there's a particular haunted house in the French quarter in New Orleans um, where as a, as an investigator, I can tell you, uh, maybe a century of, of recorded paranormal activity. And I used to live three houses down from it. I've interviewed people that live there. I'd vouch for their authenticity as witnesses. So I really do believe there is paranormal activity in the building. And sure. it has a story that we have all as tour guides told for countless years um, that everybody attributes the paranormal activity to this particular ghost. You, you might, if you've been in New Orleans, this is the Sultan's Palace in new orleans okay. it's, it's a pretty yeah, familiar you can google this familiar with that. well no. hi- historically i can tell you uh it's it's nonsense the 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 history that that makes the ghost story never happened i mean like wow. provably never happened mm-hmm. um and and we know that and yet as i've told people there are still dozens of tour guides that go by every night and hundreds of tourists that are all looking at the building and imagining the same thing while we're telling these ghost stories. And so in this case, I think probably that building is haunted by a tulpa. Yeah, for oh, sure. sure. That just took a human form because that was the ghost story. And so sometimes Absolutely. I think yeah. even you the human entities, right, 
even the human entities we deal with as, as ghost hunters aren't necessarily human or ex-human. Yeah, sure. They just mm-hmm. act human, right? And 100%. and so right, it's very much like that. And and similarly, I think, and then we could get into men in black and a lot of other things, but you you've got the converse of that where you you'll find an entity or a being that appears human but still gives you that hair on yes. the back of the neck wild yeah. animal feel and then you're like wait this i have some cognitive dissonance here not right. yeah exactly. exactly and i think that's a that's a pretty big signpost too absolutely um, yeah what a great question uh we've got just a couple others um so ben brujo said go back on rune soup <laughs> yeah, I, we were supposed to yeah. we were supposed to go back on rune soup for uh season two but it's just everything was such a nightmare we I, never got I, it i was about to say yeah. less less of a question and more of an imperative ben but but we'll allow it um <laughs> he followed up with a question i think when we were talking about getting super drunk and, and channeling pan he said what about a micro dose of mushrooms um so this, this, is, this, this is a great question mm-hmm. and 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 uh honestly this is this is the actual like legit answer is yes. We don't, I don't think we could do that on camera. Yeah. And the reason for that is, again, that idea of we don't ever want to do something that might cause harm to right. somebody else. And right. we've seen, particularly in season two, how careful we have to be with what we do and what we show people on camera. Um, and there's a few reasons. So, like, personally, absolutely, 100%. I'm, I'm, I think that uh, there are, are psychedelic substances. DMT oh, that gosh, right. in particular, but <laughs> right. I think there's research being done there that I think is um, fascinating. And the idea of those, you know, altering your perception to see reality as it is, or as it could be, or as it is somewhere else, mm-hmm. maybe next to us. Uh, I think that that is a very legitimate avenue of pursuit if it's done correctly and it's done in a, uh, if it's done in the proper manner. Mm-hmm. The problem is because of the uh, the popular view of this stuff still, which is changing, thankfully, mm-hmm. if we were to do that as a legitimate part of the Hellier investigation on camera, I don't think it would be received very well. I think yeah. we would Even... automatically get written off as sure. researchers. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, well, they're drug addicts. They're just, they're seeing things because of drugs or whatever. Yeah. And then the whole other side of that coin is how much flack are we going to get for encouraging people to do the same thing? Right. Yeah. Because right. that's a big part of Hellier 2 in particular is we're talking about all the tools we've gathered and we give them to people. And we Mm -hmm. say, take these tools and use these in your own investigations, which I think is part of the reason so many people resonate with how Right, right. I don't want to do that with drugs. Sure. Right, yeah. (laughs) Even if, you know. Want to see Goblin's uh, kids? Uh, (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) I'm pretty liberal leaning. Like, I have no problem with drugs. Uh, I, I... I, th- I think mind altering substances are probably a good thing for most people to try once. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, but I know that that is not something that would be received very well if we were to do that right. under the hellier umbrella, I think. Well, like I said, I don't, I, sure. do- I think that, I mean, I, I do, I, I do. And, but I also see the, the value of, of how it could really shift the investigation but again at the same time it's a matter of like making sure that the problem is i think we would have a lot of people who would instantly write off any direction that it could potentially lead us to and not that we really care that much i I think that's part of it too is how your uh you know it it is an initiatory experience for people watching it because there's a lot of people who fall off early because they're not meant to stick around yeah Mm -hmm. and that's fine too and the bottom line is we're i don't think that we're necessarily ruling it out because at one point in time it might be something sure. that that my concerns my concerns are just about yeah. um the, uh my concerns are just about doing about it on camera for, the, for this large yeah. audience right and how how people will respond to that mm-hmm. and internalize that yeah. because it's, it's a totally really weird sense. thing to make an offhand comment and then have somebody be like oh shit i did it i did it why yeah. did they go save the the infants that are getting Ugh. eaten by the right. lizard people under the caves of somerset well and i think we all self-edit a little bit there because earlier i said oh my gosh if you know me at all you'll know i'll go on and on about how there's no difference between aliens and fairies mm-hmm. sure and left out the and dmt beings and you know like yeah, because really sure. it's still all the same 
And so I would say, uh, Ben, you may know this already, but if you're interested in, in these kind of um, um, phenomena, uh, there's, a, there's a great, I mean, there's a lot of great books out there, but I'd start with Graham Hancock's Supernatural uh, mm. because I think Graham does a great deep dive on specifically shamanic visions, alien abductions, and fairy tales and, and shows you all the parallels between before. those three. It's in one of these shelves. Uh, yeah, I'm not right. Yeah, this, this, the same thing. I was looking around somewhere. Um, okay, so uh, three more questions, but but two of them are from me. Um, so one of them, uh, and something I just saw when I was rewatching episodes today, prepping for the interview. But I don't know how it slipped my mind the the first few times I've watched it. Hell, your season one. When we're talking about Indrid Cold, um, he's black, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, according to Secret Cipher, yes. According to Secret according Cipher, according to Secret Cipher of the Ufonauts, Terry Rist, uh, the pseudonym of the man that Greenfield interviews, right, says that uh, the ultra terrestrials, the secret chiefs, whatever, whatever you want to call them, mm -hmm. they have the ability to change their uh, appearance, ah, and that right. Indrid Cold, part of the reason that he was able to find him through, you know, uh, the the, the cipher, the ink, ink in the in black, black yeah, right is because Indrid Cold was a black man at that period okay. of time. Now I understand why I'm confused, because then we get into Derenberger in, in season two, and even yeah. the cover of the book, he's a, yeah. like the smiling man is a, is a white guy. And I was yeah, like, yeah. wait, I thought he well, was so black in season one, right? Even, so, what's so, fascinating is, is he was actually described, and even um, Tanya, Tanya described, described him. him as a very dark-skinned man. Yeah. But see. she described him as, who was the actor? George, George Hamilton. Hamilton. Like oh, overly tan, very tan. Olive. Very well, tan. and again, we don't have enough time, but that gets into the, the whole sort of stereotypical descriptions of the the sort of enlightened masters, you know, like Blavatsky uh, yeah, and, and exactly. right. And so we're, we're now right back to that description and right. Um, so, okay, fascinating. I just, I was like, why was I thinking Indrico was white this whole time? Is it just, yeah, am I being every, an every every racist? Every indication or, right. was that he was. Right. This is just the only but, reference. You know, it. the okay. secret cipher of the Euphonauts is, it's it's a weird book yeah, it's obviously obscure, right, there's right. a lot of like concepts in there and one of them was this strange idea that Indrid Cold had taken on the the visage of a black man to better hide yeah brilliant I don't know that that's the I mean again we're talking 19 that's the 1960s right that's know, the the 70s, or, oh 70s yeah if we get getting the point pleasant so I guess maybe I was like in '55, maybe that would not have been well, the choice. See, yeah, I here's the thing: I think in the '70s he was still considered white. Oh, it was the '90s, uh, yeah, that oh. that or the the early '90s or late '80s that Terry went and found him in uh -huh. Ashland, and that and that's when he was a black man. Wow! Wow! Curious, yeah. sir. Curious, sir. Yeah. So the other one. Um, again, fans of the show might know that kind of sitting underneath my own little crazy mirror. Um, this has been changing guest to guest. So I just keep hanging something different up every time. Uh, and for y'all, I don't know if you can see it well, but that is the uh, missing 411 map of the United <laughs> States. Good old David Politis. Um, and again, for those of y'all that are unfamiliar with his work, David Politis documents um, unexplained disappearances that happen in United States national parks, what the similarities are between them. And the short version of it is there are a lot more than anybody realizes, and they have a lot of things in common. Uh, but what's interesting to me is that in season two, we get our first glimpse at, at what, you know, we affectionately call the murder boards, right? Right. The, uh, right. Yeah. yeah. It's always sunny in Philadelphia, you know, like with the, <laughs> yes. the red strings yeah. and everything. Every right. single one of them has a murder board. Right. And, uh, and, and you, you've got several maps on yours. Yeah. And one of them is, is a map of the cave systems of the United States, obviously very yeah. important to the hell your investigation. Um, and as soon as I saw it, my initial reflex thought was, holy shit, that's the 411 map. Right, because when you when <laughs> right. you look at, I think it, a lot of people did. Yeah, well, I mean, like you come down in my neck of the woods, and you can see very few disappearances along the Gulf Coast. It's because we don't have any freaking caves. It's all swamps yes. and, and bayou down here. Um, and so I'm I'm curious. I know because I've heard you mention it, Greg, that, that you're familiar with with David's work. Um, yeah. But it doesn't pop up much in Hellier. Is there? Have you found correlations there? Is it? Just a, a road that has has yet to be traveled, or 
Yeah, no, we like I've I've invested in a bunch of uh, uh, Politis books, mm-hmm. and I've got the missing four one one map, mm-hmm. and you know it was really uh, halfway through season two where everybody was like, "Dude, you need to check to check out missing four hundred one, see if there's any correlations," and we did, but there wasn't anything. There was nothing that was so shocking enough to make us want to try and include it. Right. Um, I don't. I. I, I mean, there's all there's there's always more work to do with it, but I also worry a bit about. I think part of our hesitance to really try and, and, and incorporate any of the missing four one one stuff is because I don't want to overcomplicate it. Sure. More, more than <laughs> yeah, right. it already I mean, is because it's already pretty right complicated. And and the other thing too is, is like as much as I enjoy uh, the missing four one one stuff, I think the thing is it doesn't really have a thesis statement oh no he's got no answer he just presents the evidence and, and i think that's great yeah. i think that's great for for what he's doing and i re- i know why he does it that way but it's a it's kind of tough because the problem when you, when you don't have a thesis statement you can make anything fit well right right it, including it, 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 cave goblins in kentucky i mean it, right exactly right. and so i'm hesitant i right. think further down the road too because i think you have to you know sort of like remember that as, at least as far as our looking into um, the like the creation of our maps is still relatively new. Yeah, and I think with more uh, research and more compiling of, of similar cases to Hellier, if you were to ask us uh, maybe the same question like five years, I would love to take our map and five years and we've been able to collect a lot more information and then compare it because mm-hmm. I feel like right now it's still not it's still in its sort of infancy i will say i think the closest thing with the the work that politis has done uh, the closest thing that intersects with ours is he has the one book that's just dedicated to places with devil names yes Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. so one of the things that we talk a lot about are power power names names right and the hellier and right right exactly Mm -hmm. and so i think that book is the closest it comes to having a lot of crossover and the type Mm -hmm. of stuff that we're looking at yeah i didn't even think about that but you're absolutely right on that front Mm -hmm. right uh, well, and the other thing I want to see is that, and this is, you know, again, years down the road, I imagine, but I'd love to see the same maps in different times, which is to yeah. say, yeah. show me the heat map in the 1970s and then show me That's the same awesome. heat map 25 years later. Um, yeah. Because again, and, and Greg, you and I were, were kind of discussing this just before we went live, but um, I kind of have this feeling, again, I spent most of season two just screaming they're ley lines at the TV screen, you know, a whole <laughs> yes, lot. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Well, especially when you talk about the similarities between not only place names, but even uh, the fact that there are bridges and all those bridges connect in a line. And there are, yeah. you know, sculptures. Bridges and borders. Sculptures and... Of, of butterfly winged insect people, whether that's Mothman mm-hmm. or the one way out. And, you know, and those connect. And and my thinking is, is if we accept as the, you know, uh, um, a priori basis that there is something old and magical sleeping underneath one of those caves somewhere. Uh, as I told Greg, I said, I think every once in a while it like rolls over in its sleep. <laughs> yeah. And when it rolls over in its sleep, it sends a ripple out that goes, David, 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 Parsons, 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 Bridge, Bridge. Bridge. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, for sure. But the thing is, is that, and that's why the flaps seem temporarily random because it's the, right. the fact that you don't regularly turn over in your sleep it's just whenever yeah. it happens and yet we see the flaps hit these lines almost and so that's what i want to say i want to go well wait if if it happened here in january and there in february and there in april can we trace it back temporally to show mm-hmm. the direction of the line and get back to an origin and all sorts of yeah you know. i think that is one of the big goals of the hellier project is being able to get to a point where we can predict a flap yeah Ooh. where yeah, where not necessarily that we can we can we can also go backwards and see like maybe where it's originating but i think what we really want to do is we want to get to the point where we can look at the patterns and go if we're correct get ahead of it in two mm-hmm. in two years something very big is going to happen in, in this, this place area. here yeah. so we need to be there when it happens and timing is such a thing with this whole yeah. investigation uh that really, i would yeah. not be surprised that that would happen that eventually you'll see some sort of 
temporal component. Just in the way that all of those random misspellings weren't random, they applied to the cipher. Absolutely. We'll find out dates and times are doing the same thing. We just haven't quite exactly. gotten there in the investigation. Yep. And, and then we'll be there for it as it's there, and we can document it, everything happening mm -hmm. in real time. Uh, group, group museum live event. We'd <laughs> yeah. like to be yeah. there when See, it happens. This is the crazy thing. There's so many of the live events they from always, the museum yeah. in season two. Yeah. Because like in cases, the investigation is never over. It's never over. Yeah. And sometimes it just happens. Right. Like we've been doing Estes methods. There was a while where Dana just couldn't do them anymore because she kept getting walk-ins. It was just like, there yeah. were just mm -hmm. these things mm -hmm. from the hellier ripples that just kept it was coming around, through. You know and we what? couldn't even do a regular Estes method. It session. was, it was around the time of the tomes uh, around that time mm -hmm. where it was and they were like, like, they were like, Oh, we've been waiting for you. Like, where have you been? Them. We've been trying to talk to you. Yeah. So, it never ends and we are always we always i'm glad we live in the world we live in because we can pick up a camera anywhere yeah and right. just video what's going on and there's a lot of that in season two where it's live stream footage iphone footage gopro footage it's crazy so i, I promised you and a couple other people i would try to end on a sinister note oh, no. <laughs> so i'm gonna end on one more sinister note let's go all the way back to tenny where where he's he's warning you about keel and and going crazy and and things like that um i know that you had the one uh sort of harrowing experience at the denny's at 3 a.m um, oh my god where you know and, and again correct me if i'm wrong long story short uh you were just using the public restroom in the denny's and somebody walked into the next stall and started whistling your theme music of hell so at 3 a.m in so denny's oh yeah i mean I would be banned Street, from... The stream just stopped. Yeah. <laughs> and well, that was the crazy part. I was on my way to Somerset for the first time since we filmed to go mm -hmm. hang out with uh, Nate and Kyle and get some info that they had. And I didn't want anyone to know I was there. Mm -hmm. And that was, that turned out, I they had that experience. And I was like, oh shit, somebody recognized me. And I really thought I was going to be hassled. Mm -hmm. um, person disappeared. Got back out to the car, sat down. I was middle of texting Dana, like, you want to hear the scariest thing ever? And and uh, Connor texted me and said, happy Terry Wrist anniversary email day. No kidding. It was the same Wait, was day. this 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 week in February that, that all the, that window yes. where everything lands, that happened in that same window? It happened on the same day. Oh, same son exact of a day. bitch. Literally moments after you experienced that, Connor texted Wow. Be, and then I went back. I, cause I like, oh. I didn't, you know, you know, journal etiquette. You don't turn, <laughs> you don't, you don't, turn, you don't guy, talk. You don't, right. Exactly. No, you just, and so I was like, oh shit, if I just ignore this guy, he'll, he'll think he has the wrong guy and he'll mm -hmm. leave. Right. Mm -hmm. But I could tell that he was dressed in kind of like a trucker so he had outfit. Boots on. He had boots on. He had a blue, light blue baseball cap. And I could tell he had like white beard. And he was shorter. Yeah. He was about maybe a little shorter than I, maybe about the same height. Mm -hmm. And uh, I flat as soon as I read that text from Connor, I flashed back to Greenfield saying, "Oh, I think Rist will meet you. I don't think you're going to meet yeah, him. I think he'll right. meet you, and he's going to be dressed in an out of date Sinclair uniform and pumping your gas." And I was like, "Oh shit!" Because it wasn't Denny's, it was the gas station. Oh, you were at gas. I took okay, a, I, thought I took you, a picture. You were just Denny's telling us the, the way Denny's. Home. Right, right, right. Retreat to the Denny's to regroup. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's when I was like, "Shit, did I just?" meet terry and not yeah, realize it right. i feel like that's if he was going to do it it, just it is his it sort of yeah the, the playfulness we would expect uh but in that line so but have have you seen any other and i don't know how else to put the supernatural kind of harassment well have you been getting the weird staticky phone calls or you know visits from strange men in black or doppelgangers or, or anything else like that there's none of that sort of high strangeness around the investigator that it, that I mean, you've, to done, you've gotten weird letters. I, oh yeah, here's with, so this is what's funny is I we always joke like we want those email or those those phone calls that, that Keel was, like, was getting, kind of on right. it, you know, yeah, because that's such an iconic calls. thing. But um, I don't think we live in that world anymore. Like, who answers their phone? Yeah, you know true. what I mean? Everybody <laughs> screens their calls. You know that. All that stuff happened before caller ID. So I think even if I absolutely would screen a man in black call right off my phone. Absolutely. You're, you're right. You'd be like, oh, I don't know who this. I'm not answering right. that. Right. I think, you know, 
Who do anomalous I know from Venus? Emails. That's not right. <laughs> <laughs> anomalous emails. You're going to read them. Anom yeah. Anomalous messages. But we have now started to receive letters. Physical letters. Physical oh, wow. letters. Interesting. Uh, from the Alliance is who they call themselves. Right. These are All your international bankers, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but see, that, but this is, this, and I'll be honest right now. Mm -hmm. I was disappointed it wasn't from the international bankers because yeah. the Alliance sounds so lame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come on, guys, was, do better. I, and and right. the, the letters are, mm -hmm. the, I mean, there's calligraphy, like everything's calligraphy. calligraphy on it. Someone and has taken a lot of time. Someone took a lot of time. Um, the the very nice paper, and it's just sort of like I, you know, Mr. Newkirk, I represent the Alliance. Um, we're a group of like-minded individuals, yada yada. And then there's like a bullet point list of information we need to know about the case. Some okay. of which are intriguing, mm -hmm. but some of which are like lines from the Mothman movie not the and book. not the book. Right. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's like that. Right. But the crazy thing about it is, like I, t I said earlier, I think, because my first indication is like, ah, try harder. This is a scam. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, okay, sure. But there are elements in that letter that I was like, one day I was like, ah, screw it. I'll look into it. So I start looking around, and now it has opened up an entirely new avenue of investigation of in i mean insane synchronicity storms that have lasted for a month all because of a letter that i'm pretty sure is just fake yeah people playing around right? but there someone is actual to do information it. someone was compelled to send that mm -hmm. maybe they just thought oh it's funny but there's actual information in there that has led to some pretty big uh some pretty big stuff interesting all so right. i so think there's that trickster element well, always, right? I was about to say, since you're undoubtedly watching Alliance, uh, <laughs> please keep sending information, uh, but but change your name. That would be I yeah. posted, be here, and here's the other thing, too. I posted online, because the biggest net I have is my social media. Sure. I posted a thing about it online, and I was like, listen, if you're going to send these, like, at least give me a way to contact you back. Yeah, right. that's true. We couldn't even. Like, because that was the other thing. Like, I've got questions. If this is for real, you want to keep this up. It's already led me somewhere really interesting. So mm -hmm. give me a way to contact you back. Um, you know, you could burn her phone at Walmart, man. Mm -hmm. T 20 bucks, load it up prepaid and just, right. you know. You. Well, that's what I me. was wondering. I was wondering, you know, we were talking about men in black calling on the phone. Like, I wonder if you, you, we'll start getting cryptic texts from burner that phones. Awesome. You know, like that would be the new man in black method, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm if surprised it hasn't happened, but yeah. who, knows? who knows? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> that's just it. Um, well, Guys, again, uh, I, I thought I was going to be lucky to have you for two hours, and we are we're pushing up on three. Um, oh, dude, this is great. Thank this has been amazing. So no, uh, a dream come true. Uh, my goodness. Any ways that I can help you all out from, from our little realm here in, in New Orleans, uh, obviously I'm at your disposal. And whenever we can all travel again, uh, we'll get you all down to New Orleans by hook or by Absolutely. crook. Oh, my and, God. Yeah. I literally – New Orleans is one of my favorite cities on earth, uh, and I never need an excuse to come and visit New Orleans. I, I love it there so, so much. So Well, there you go. Y'all got, got a place to stay. We got a spare bedroom. We can wave the hotel. We'll, we'll hook y'all up. So oh, love um, it. We'll be there. Shucks. And everybody else, I mean it. Um, now that we're closing our season down, uh, I promise I'll be back sometime in some way we don't know what that's going to look like uh i have to decide whether or not like we're going back to work in the next two or three weeks you know like we're right. starting to get to that strange time uh where we have to start considering reopening but uh if you know god forbid we have a second wave but if history and math are any indication and we're back in this situation in the fall uh certainly we'll figure out something else i was telling greg i have this kind of half-brained idea where i want to sit down with folks like y'all and talk about anything but the subject that you always talk about that's when you come so on. That's so funny. Right? I think I that's a that. great idea. Right. That's fantastic. So we'll have the Newkirks on to talk about anything but Hellier and Goblins. Like, I want to hear y'all's Waverly stories and hold them up next to mine and, and oh all sorts of things yeah. like that. Uh, I have Ghost play uh, straight Will-O-Wisp with me in the death tunnel. Um, Waverly, Waverly is its own universe. And, it is um, unbelievable. We've got the uh, we, we've got the EMF. I mean, I, we taped the whole 
traversing of the death tunnel uh, with my little iPhone camera. And it was just my wife and I. It was my equipment, so I know it wasn't you know rigged. It wasn't given to me this as set up. So there's some spooky stuff in that place yeah. for sure. Yep. Uh, and so yeah, that's I think what we're gonna try to do next. If we do that, we're gonna have Calvin back. We're gonna have everybody else. Uh, yes. Oh, my wife, bless her heart. Yeah. Um, she asked me, uh, what about the drawing for the Blu-ray stickers and super special oh, baseball yeah. cap? Oh, yeah. I thought we established the super special baseball cap was going to the host. But, uh, <laughs> no. um, all right, let's see real quick. I will uh, ask my uh, virtual assistant to draw a name from afar. And as soon as they get back to me, we will announce a... Uh, I cannot keep this drum roll up for as long as it's going to take her to text me back. <laughs> uh, and for what it's worth, uh, we we raised uh, a little more than $100 for our guides, uh, which is amazing, right? That's uh, so good. Nice job. Yep. Um, it's, it's, it's been, and we saw this with, with the con, and I won't get too far into it, but that's the other thing that if the, this epidemic has brought out in everybody, the, the generosity that has come out has just been astonishing. The love that was shown to those speakers at the con. It was a uh, beautiful, and, crazy, and incredible again, thing. You know, I don't, I don't have the social media reach that the museum does, but I would say we've, we've been seeing the same. Um, great. That's yeah, amazing. The, the same kind of uh, perspective here. So it's been great guys. Um, there you go. I just got my text back. So uh, our official winner, of the hell your package is Karen. I assume that's going to be Karen Stevens since she's a pretty regular fan. Um, but let me see, Karen, if you're here, drop a comment to let us know that that's you or somebody. Uh, but otherwise, Karen, you're going to be the envy of New Orleans paranormal broadcasters everywhere. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Um, I'm just going to get her to come back to New Orleans and then trade or something for the, uh, you know, I'm sure I have a haunted <laughs> object back here. Well, hopefully yeah. they'll be manufacturing them again. Yeah. They just, they, they stop. I think it, the COVID shut down the baseball cap manufacturing company. So they just, they don't make them anymore. I have one of the yeah. first Give them ones. Time. Give them time. Oh, you know what? Um, uh, do me a favor. Karen is the winner. If you'll message me, uh, at any point and give me uh, the appropriate t-shirt size. Oh, there we go. Hooray, Karen Stevens. Yeah, Karen Stevens, give me the t-shirt the size that you want and I'll connect with Greg. And Greg, I'm going to have you throw uh, my supporter t-shirt that's coming to me oh, as, sure. a, as a preservationist. Throw that in there as well. Um, okay, and then perfect. I'll just pick yeah. up another copy on my own. So Awesome. Um, absolutely. Uh, I want to say thanks to to a few people who are chiming in here at the end. Um, Christina Grant, who's our Irish person, and God even knows, it's like five. Christina, get up, make some coffee, and some breakfast um, <laughs> yeah. in Ireland. My goodness. I'm a full English. Yeah. Uh, Teresa says, I hope you'll be able to keep up the interviews. Uh, Teresa, I absolutely will. Um, I just, number one, am not going to be able to immediately top Greg and Dana, so I'm not going to try. <laughs> uh, and number two, um, I, we, we just want to kind of clean it up, figure out what kind of format we can keep this sustainable. Uh, because otherwise speaking, just as the guy putting it all together, uh, I'll burn out and get fed up with it. And then there will be no more interviews. So uh, that's what we're, that's what we're figuring out, but we'll be back in some form or another. Uh, and if we do, uh, you two, I, I hope you'll, you'll come back and join us again. Oh, anytime. Of course. It's well. so much fun. Of course. Uh, so I'm going to say, uh, oh, Karen says, thanks to everybody. Um, thanks to all of you. Uh, we will have more live content for you, uh, whether it's paranormal or, or New Orleans themed or otherwise on the Facebook page. So uh, keep checking back in with us. Uh, you can go to nosecretstores.com and find out when we're going to be back open for business. Uh, we're going to hope that's in a few weeks. Uh, other than that, y'all, um, as always, stay healthy, stay weird. Uh, we love every last one of you. Uh, once more, Greg and Dana Newkirk, uh, thank y'all so much for being on Thanks the show. Thanks for having us, man. Yeah. This is great. Uh, awesome. Well, we're going to say bye. Uh, cheers, everybody. We're going to end our live video, I think. Yeah, once That's again, the hardest part too is you're like, isn't this a great part? And you're always like, oh, we'll just part. cut this part in post.